children's medicine. We'll hear from officials with the Food and Drug Administration, as well as a representative from manufacturer Johnson & Johnson's Consumer Group. This is two hours and 45 minutes. Many will come to order. Good morning and thank you for being here today. Anytime we give our children or grandchildren's medicines like this bottle of children's Tylenol that was included in the recall, we expect it to be safe and we expect it to help the children get better not create problems for them. When questions are raised about whether children's medicine is safe, parents need immediate answers. Almost every household in this country has these children's products in their medicine cabinets. And everyone has the same question this morning. Are these products safe? And what are we doing to ensure the safety and to make certain that this does not happen again. While we, didn't, we do not want to cause unnecessary alarm, we also cannot ignore the troubling fact before us. Less than a month ago, a Johnson & Johnson company known as McNeil Consumer Healthcare recalled over 40 variations of children's medicines, including such widely used products as children's Tylenol, children's Motrin, children's Benadryl, Tylenol, and infant's drops. This recall was carried out because of production problems at McNeil that affected the quality, purity, and potency of the medicine. McNeil received dozens of consumer complaints about foreign particles in children's medicine, which were later confirmed by McNeil. In addition, tests at the plant showed that three batches of infants' Tylenol were found to be superpotent, meaning that they contain an overdose of the active ingredient. McNeil's productions of children's medicine was shut down by the company, and a month later it still is shut down. The FDA is currently investigating any possible links between the recall medicine and adverse health effects on children who took that medicine. The FDA is also currently reviewing reports of children who died to determine if there is any connection between those deaths and this recall. At this point, the FDA is not aware of any connection between the recall medicine and the death of any child. One document the committee received from the FDA refers to the case of a year and a half one and a half year old girl who died. That document reads the coroner's office call to report the death of a one and a half year old female that is suspected to be related to a Tylenol product. Just last night, the committee obtained from the FDA even more disturbing information. According to an FDA document, McNeil knew there was a potential problem with one of its Motrin products that was on the market in 2008. But rather than issue a recall, McNeil allegedly sent contractors out to the stores to buy the products back and told the stores not to mention a recall. After the FDA confronted McNeil about this, McNeil officially enacted a recall of, uh, on the affected products. If true, this phantom recall attempt by McNeil could have endangered the public and it warrants further investigation by this committee. We need to know that health risks are associated with this recall. We need to know whether this is an isolated issue are part of a widespread problem with the safety and production of children's medicine at McNeil. 
We need to know that Johnson and Johnson is what Johnson and Johnson is doing uh, to get to the bottom of this. And we need to know what the FDA is doing to ensure the safety of children's medicine and whether the FDA has the resources it needs to carry out its mission. But Johnson and Johnson and the FDA will be asked very difficult questions today, and I hope they are prepared to give us the answers that will assure safety of these medications. This is our first hearing on this issue, but there may be more. We will follow this road until we have all the answers and the questions that are raised by the people are answered. There is nothing this committee will investigate that is more serious than the health of our children. I can assure you that as chairman of this committee, and I know on this matter I also speak for the ranking member, when I say this, we will use all of our authority to find out what went wrong and do everything that we can to ensure that it does not happen again. On this note, I yield to five minutes to the ranking member of the committee, the Congressman Issa from the great state of California. Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you are right. You speak for both of us when you say we will use all efforts of this committee and all power of this committee to ensure this does not happen again. Johnson & Johnson has owned the McNeil Consumer Health Care Division since 1959. So for one, from this day forward, I will say Johnson & Johnson and not talk about a subsidiary that has been owned by a company for so long. Before I came to the Congress, I was a manufacturer. I understand ISO 9001, certainly a, a good but lesser standard than what we expect medical procedure, uh, medical items and food items to be held to. But there is no question that my manufacturing techniques were less than I would have expected if I were going to put a product in my mouth. Producing electronics, you want it to work, and you want it to work reliably. You want it to work consistently, and you want it to never hurt anyone. But my company knew that we would produce product that from time to time would be installed poorly. We knew that from time to time we would have a bad transistor, resistor, or diode. We did not produce to aviation specs because to be honest, an alarm going off because of a malfunction was less of a problem. But today we are talking about a market leader, a leader who had so much confidence of the American people that we never questioned their products or their services, whose creed was all about safety and reliability. And they have disappointed us. We are not the Committee of Manufacturing. We are not the Committee of Jurisdiction directly over health care products or, for that matter, any of the manufacturing sector in this country. That is for other committees. What we are is the committee that oversees government's overseeing of its responsibility. Today we have before us the FDA. And much like the uh, National Transportation Safety and other parts of the Department of Transportation, we have an agency who has done their job. They have delivered report after report of problems. And they have come to a final conclusion before coming to this committee of a massive recall. So like Akio Toyota, we would hope that Johnson & Johnson comes ready to say this is a mistake that will not happen again, that the company will, in fact, change how it does business so significantly as to never be before us again. But as to the FDA, I am encouraged that they have done their job, but I am disappointed that it took so long. As, as with the national transportation questions that we had before Secretary LaHood, today I will be interested to know what changes at FDA would allow for, if you will, shortcuts to this conclusion. How do we find that a manufacturing technique that is below standard is corrected more quickly? How do we ensure that there are no backdoor or if you will, unannounced recalls? And how do we ensure that the FDA has all of the authority and financing that it needs to ensure the American people that not just a 120-year-old company, well regarded and able to pay for all the cost of their mistakes, but that every 
piece of over-the-counter or prescription medicine or, for that matter, food, whether domestic or foreign import, as so much is today, is safe. I am deeply concerned, Mr. Chairman, that Johnson & Johnson is the tip of the iceberg. If one of the most reliable and responsible organizations in America and a company with great connections to the community can fail us, then what about those aspirins and other products that are more and more being imported from outside our country, from factories that are harder to reach and people who do not even uh, speak our language when we go to inspect them? So although today is about Johnson & Johnson, and I hope the second panel does their, their job of explaining why they will not be in front of us again, I am most in interested in the first panel. What do we need to do as the Committee on Oversight and Reform to ensure that you are able to do your job worldwide safely so the American people can sleep knowing that these kinds of medicines, no matter where they are made in the world, will be absolutely safe from this day forward. I thank the Chairman and yield back. I would like to thank the gentleman from California for his um, uh, statement. And, of course, I want you to know that uh, I agree with you. Uh, I would like to just recognize um, the Brooklyn Friends School who is here. You know, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Could you please stand up? Yeah. Brooklyn. You can't be recognized when you are just there we go. Yeah. Brooklyn Friends School, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Uh, we will turn now to our first witness, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, is the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. He is our witness today from the FDA, but he is accompanied by Deborah Otter and Michael Chappell who will not be making opening statements, but are here to provide any additional expertise that may be helpful to the committee. Deborah Otter is the Director of the Office of Compliance at the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration, and Michael Chappell is the Acting Associate Commissioner for Regulatory Affairs at the FDA. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand while I minister the oath. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, Uh, Dr. Sharfstein, well, we, we, being you're the only person making an opening statement, so let okay. me start with you. Great. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having this hearing. I am Joshua Sharfstein, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. I'm a pediatrician and I'm the former Health Commissioner of Baltimore, Maryland. I want to talk to you about what happened at McNeil, what FDA has done, and I want to answer your questions. I am joined, as you mentioned, by Deb Otter who is also a former prosecutor at the Department of Justice and a finalist for the Service to America Medal, and by Mike Chappell, who is a 38-year veteran of FDA. The FDA has authority in, uh, over drug manufacturing both to enforce general good manufacturing practice requirements and to require companies to comply with their own rules. McNeil Consumer Healthcare makes a variety of over-the-counter products for the U.S. market from four manufacturing facilities in the United States and Canada. Over the last several years, FDA has had growing concerns about the quality of the company's manufacturing process reflected in unsatisfactory inspections and recalls. FDA inspected the company's facilities with an increased frequency, and in February 2010, the agency convened the management of its parent company Johnson & Johnson to express concern about a pattern of noncompliance. This is a story of an agency that identified a problem, confronted a company, and eventually forced major changes to protect the public. I now like to walk you through some of the key events. Prior to 2009, FDA investigators identified several problems with good manufacturing practices at facilities run by McNeil. These problems included laboratory controls, equipment cleaning processes, and a failure to investigate identified problems. The company generally fixed these problems and the agency inspected the firm regularly. 
At its Fort Washington facility, McNeil makes a wide variety of over-the-counter products, including a large number of over-the-counter liquid products for children. In May of, and June of 2009, FDA identified several violations, including McNeil's failure to meet its own standard for quality in one of its ingredients in over-the-counter liquids. McNeil's standard for this ingredient, known as microcrystalline cellulose, required that there be no gram-negative bacteria. McNeil purchased the cellulose in partial lots that had not tested positive for this objectionable bacteria, but the vendor had tested other partial lots from the same master lot and had found a certain bacteria called Burkholdia cepacea. According to its standards, McNeil should not have used any of the partial lots from this master lot. In reviewing the situation, FDA scientists at the time concluded that the risk to the public was remote. All of the drums that, that were used had tested negative for the bacteria. All the final product had tested negative, and FDA agreed with the company's assessment that this bacteria would be very unlikely to grow in the final product. Yet because the company had not kept to its standard, it represented a significant violation of manufacturing practices, and the company initiated a recall of almost 8 million bottles of finished product. A few months later, in Puerto Rico, where McNeil makes a large number of over-the-counter pills for the U.S. market, FDA became aware that the company had received reports of products from this facility having a musty odor. Yet McNeil had not fully investigated these reports for about a year and did not notify FDA despite the requirements that such reports be referred to the agency within three days. FDA inspectors urged McNeil to conduct a complete investigation, which eventually identified the source of the odor to be a chemical called TBA, which was in the air because of a pesticide used on the wood of the pallets to store empty medication bottles. McNeil initiated a series of recalls as the scope of the problem became clear. The risk to the public by this problem included potential temporary, non-serious reactions, including nausea, stomach pain, vomiting, and possibly diarrhea. Very little is known about this chemical called TBA, but in the small quantities transferred to the products, it was not thought to pose a serious risk for long-term health problems. On January 15, 2010, FDA issued a warning letter expressing serious concerns about the company's control over the quality of its products and the company's failure to aggressively investigate and correct quality problems. FDA noted in this public warning letter that neither upper management at Johnson & Johnson nor McNeil had assured timely investigation and resolution of the issues. On February 19, 2010, in the wake of that warning letter, senior compliance staff from FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation Research and the field organization called a meeting with senior officials from McNeil and its parent company, Johnson & Johnson. Attendees included the president of McNeil, the company group chairman for over-the-counter drugs at Johnson & Johnson, as well as a number of quality assurance executives from both companies. This was an extraordinary meeting. FDA requested that senior officials from Johnson & Johnson attend the meeting over the heads of the McNeil executives so they would be on notice regarding FDA's rising concerns about whether McNeil's corporate culture supported a robust quality system to ensure the purity, potency, and safety of its products. FDA raised concerns about multiple recalls, based on the recent inspections and expressed concern that there was a pattern of failure to report material information to FDA in a timely manner. FDA told the company that significant immediate steps were needed to address issues of compliance and quality. We learned that the company was taking major steps to address these issues, but we told them we would not take their word for it. They would expect close oversight um, ongoing. In April, FDA returned to the McNeil's facility um, in Fort Washington. This was an inspection that was scheduled sooner than usual because of the history of compliance problems. Days before the inspectors arrived, McNeil shut down manufacturing because of particulates found in a number of liquid medications, including acetaminophen, cellulose, nickel, and chromium. We identified a range of violations, including failure to meet its own specifications for bacteria and particulates and for one Tylenol product, the possibility of higher than expected concentrations of Tylenol. In reviewing the situation, FDA scientists concluded the risk posed to the public by these problems was remote. We did not find evidence that McNeil used raw materials that its tests found to be positive for bacterial contamination and that all finished lots tested negative. The particles would be expected to pass through the gastrointestinal tract. And while there was a potential for higher concentrations of Tylenol per dropper, none of the final products tested with, safe, tested with high levels. 
Although the public health risk from these quality problems is low, these problems should never have occurred, and the manufacturing failures at the facility that caused them were unacceptable. Following requirements assures that products are consistent in their safety and effectiveness, and failure to follow these procedures risks more serious problems and undermines consumer confidence. On April 30th, McNeil announced a voluntary recall of over 136 million bottles of liquid, infants, and children's products. The agency is now closely monitoring the implementation of a corrective action plan that includes changes to, to McNeil's quality system, organizational changes, and senior management oversight. FDA will take steps to ensure that when this facility begin man begins to manufacture again, it will be able to produce safe products. We are also considering additional enforcement actions against the company, which may include seizure, injunction, and criminal penalties. I want to just to say uh, one word about adverse events. It is understandable that many Americans hearing about these large recalls are wondering whether or not their children were put at risk. In assessing this question, FDA considers two sources of information. First, our assessment of the manufacturing problems themselves, and second, adverse event reports to the agency. As I discussed earlier, FDA analyzed the various manufacturing problems. Based on the circumstances in each case, our experts believe the risk for any child in the United States was remote. We also looked and are looking at adverse event reports reported to the agency. We receive these reports and often request and review medical records, coroner reports, and other supplementary data sources. In one case, we had a report of a six-year-old uh, child uh, where the, the uh, child died as a result of an infection for, from Bercoldia cepatia, the same bacteria that was found in the lot of the ingredient. FDA actually got a hold of the medications used by this child and tested them, and we conducted extra inspections to see whether there was a connection between this death and the product. Um, in fact, the, the, all the samples tested negative, and FDA believed that there was not a connection in that particular case. When we have adequate information, we review the reports to determine what role, if any, the medication played in the development of an adverse event. We can find the medication had no role in the adverse event, that the activity as a drug could cause a serious side effect, or that a quality problem may have contributed to the outcome. So far, um, FDA does recognize that some of the reports may reflect the side effects of the medications, but we have no cases with evidence that a product quality problem contributed to a significant adverse health outcome for children. We are continuing to receive information about certain cases, and we will update the public and the committee should our assessment change. Let me close by noting that every investigation presents an opportunity to, for FDA to improve our effectiveness in protecting public health. In this case, uh, we have learned more about the importance of corporate structure for compliance. When we do not get a response that we're comfortable with from a subsidiary, FDA will not hesitate, as we did not in this case, to go over their heads to the corporate parents. FDA will be developing new procedures to use what we learn at one facility in guiding our inspections of other facilities run by the same company. We have also gained experience with two issues that we're working on at the agency, how to improve our recall process and how to strengthen enforcement. FDA Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg has called for FDA's enforcement to be vigilant, strategic, quick, and visible. A range of activities are underway at the agency to bring this vision to reality, including strengthening our criminal enforcement of FDA's laws. We, are, we will continue to work with Congress to secure additional authority to assist us. Let me just uh, mention, in this regard, we believe that transparency in our enforcement activities is very important, um, both so people can see what we're doing and to, to, to make sure that we're accountable. And as part of our new program performance effort at FDA called FDA Track, we are, we are going to be posting monthly the numbers of different kinds of enforcement actions that FDA is taking. And as part of our transparency task force, we have proposed making public every inspection, when it's happening, and what the outcome of that inspection is. We're getting public comment on that. I would end by saying that this episode reminds us that a vigilant FDA is essential to drug safety in the United States. FDA inspectors identified serious problems at McNeil, called the company to account, and, and forced major changes to protect the public. On behalf of the many FDA staff who worked on uh, and are continuing to work on this issue, I appreciate the opportunity to make this statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharfstein, for your uh, statement. Let me just begin by saying this. The FDA need 
more enforcement authority or funding to be able to respond to issues like this recall? I mean, or well, um, thank you. I think that um, it's instructive to, to think about the food safety bill a little bit because in the food safety bill there's some provisions that um, uh, Congress is looking at granting the FDA over food that we don't currently have over drugs. And those include um, uh, authority to require certain types of quality systems and preventive controls, mandatory recall authority, um, access to records um, by companies, and uh, civil money penalties. So th those are some areas where we don't have a position at this point, it hasn't worked its way through the system. Uh, with respect to drugs, I, I would point those out, that those are in the food safety bill. The administration is supporting those for foods. Right. Let me ask this. Can you say with complete certainty that no children who took the medicine that were recalled last month were harmed by them? No, I cannot say that with complete certainty. I think what we're continuing to get information and there were remote risks that were potentially possible. But from what we know, we do not have evidence at this point of children who did have serious problems. But because there was a remote risk, it was the right thing to do to do the recall. Right. But you're still looking at, uh, are you still looking to see in terms of whether or not this occurred? That's correct. We are. And there, there are certain reports that we've gotten that we're in the process of um, thoroughly reviewing. There's, how serious were the problems at, at McNeil's plant in Fort Washington that the FDA most recently discovered? How serious were they? I think as manufacturing uh, problems go, they were serious. They, there was a range of different problems. They had um, not responded to the complaints that they'd gotten of particulates in the product. They um, had missed um, the fact that some of the, uh, their, their ingredients came from a lot that had had contamination, even though the previous year they knew this to be a, an issue. Um, there were a wide range of findings that indicated to us that there were serious manufacturing quality problems at the facility. Right. What went wrong that caused one of the largest makers of children's medicine to recall millions you know, is it quality control? What do you think that uh, might have happened here? Well, I think that that's a great question and it can be answered at different levels. I think one level you answer it is exactly like you said, it's quality control, that there were quality control problems. At another level you have to ask why? Why did a company with the reputation and record of, of McNeil and Johnson & Johnson have those quality control problems? And um, we think that, uh, that that's a very important question for, for you to be looking at. It's something we need to understand better. We think it may relate to the uh, corporate compliance and corporate structure. And we, we note that the company has made major changes in that when we confronted them with a very serious compliance problem that they were having. Could you sort of describe to us what you're doing now to work with Johnson & Johnson to make sure that they correct the problems that exist? Sure. Well, the, the, this facility in Fort Washington is now not manufacturing. Um, there is a complete plan for standing it back up that the company is going to be presenting to FDA. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we have a very good cooperation from the company now that they're really looking for the agency's seal of approval before they uh, get going, and I'm sure you'll hear that from them um, on the next panel. And in addition, to what we're working on there, we are also reviewing the record and considering whether other um, types of enforcement actions are appropriate. Right. Dr. Sharfstein, um, tell me what the FDA believes McNeil did as described in these FDA documents that we receive. Uh, can you say that again? On I'm screen. sorry. You're on the screen, Dot. Oh, I see. You're on the screen. What do we believe actually happened here? Yes. Mm -hmm. This is something that um, is troubling to the agency. Um, I'm not sure we know it, the, the, the complete full story, but basically there, were, um, there was a problem with how Motrin uh, tablets uh, dissolve and whether or not patients would get the right dose. And um, the company notified FDA that we would be, um, let's pull this out, that that they were going to be evaluating whether there was a product on the shelves to recall. And then we were alerted, uh, I believe, by the, uh, one of the state boards of pharmacy that 
instead of just looking to see whether or not um, there was medication to recall, the company had, had, had a contractor that was going out and trying to buy up um, all the medicine when they went into the store and the information said you should simply act like a regular customer while making these purchases. There must be no mention of this being a recall of the product. If asked, simply state your employer is checking the distribution chain of this product and needs to have some of it purchased for the pro project. I don't think we really, you know, fully understood exactly what was going on. It, it was troubling to us and when FDA found out about this, we insisted that an actual recall occur. And we, we did think that it, it reflected poorly on the company and it was one of the things that FDA brought to their attention during this uh, extraordinary meeting that happened in February. Right. Thank you. After the recall, FDA recommended consumers buy drugstore alternatives for their children. The vast majority of those drugstores products are made by Perigo, a company in Michigan that has had ongoing quality control problems. When was the last time FDA inspected the plant in Michigan that makes infants and children products? You know when it was inspected last? Um, I do. Um, I may ask uh, Deb Otter to answer that because she um, uh, oversees the um, compliance efforts at the Center for Drugs. I believe there were several inspections in the last couple of years. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I don't have the exact dates here, but there have been several inspections in the last few years. Um, I believe there have been two in 2010, but I would have to double check those facts. I but you agree with the fact there have been some issues with quality control? Yes, there have been some issues at Perigo. Yeah. Okay, on that note, I yield to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Arthur, I'd, I'd like to follow up. Is it appropriate for the FDA to, recognize, rep, rep, to recommend an alternative at all? Is that uh, basically, if you say don't do that, or baby doctor, if yeah. you'd prefer, it, isn't it isn't it really appropriate for the FDA to simply deal with its knitting and say don't take that and not intervene in in alternatives? Well, the challenge is, I I I think I, I know there's an irresistible urge to answer people's questions. I I'm in that business, but uh, yeah. but isn't it in fact inappropriate for any government entity? to make a recommendation unless it's an authorized recommendation. It doesn't appear as though there's any mandate for that. I think Dr. Hamburg and I see FDA as a public health agency that has to be responsive to the needs of clinicians and patients. And it very frequently happens that there's a shortage of one medication. And we have a whole shortage team that works with um, manufacturers and professional societies to give recommendations in the event of a shortage for what can be used as an alternative. I think it's wrong to say this brand is, is the right one to okay. use. But when people don't know what is available for the FDA to say, we want you to know this medication is available and as a potential alternative, I think that's information that the clinical community really wants to hear from FDA. We have another, um, for example. Um, and I have no problem with the mm -hmm. clinical community. When you speak doctors to doctors, I certainly appreciate that. I, my only question was, you know, where is the line? I think all of us want to know where is the line when it's ultimately to the public, to the uninformed public. Uh, you know, you're, as you said, a brand name would be inappropriate. But uh, a chemical de description, I gather, is what you're saying would be uh, appropriate, which would cover potentially multiple brands. Right. Okay. Uh, Ms. Arthur, one that I know falls more squarely on you. Uh, in this case, I don't want you to say you have an investigation or you don't, but is there a potential criminal liability for some of the acts that went on? I think what I can say at this point is that the uh, Center for Drugs has referred this to FDA's criminal uh, investigative unit and then they have to judge where to go from there. Okay. I will take that as a yes, that there is at least the potential and that, that everyone who is out there providing food and drugs should be aware that the scenario we just saw in the future or perhaps in this case could lead to criminal actions uh, or, you know, uh, indictments. Uh, at least that that's the, the, not saying in this case, but that that should be fair warning to people who are watching this hearing. And I think as Dr. Sharfstein said, the agency is working to 
uh, increase our enforcement on the criminal side and to uh, connect carefully what we do on the criminal side with what we do on the civil side so that we can maximize the effectiveness of those tools. And, and yes, I, th doctor. I think that's an excellent point. We, we very much want to send that message. Um, Dr. Hamburg, the commissioner, gave a major address on enforcement where she called on companies to be, uh, make sure they had excellent compliance programs. And just this week, someone sent me a uh, email about a, a course and report that is being marketed where it says, um, Bigger, tougher, faster, preparing for the new FDA. When the inspector comes calling, will you be ready? And it is all about sending a message to industry. This is within industry. They're marketing this, that FDA is significantly strengthening its oversight and companies have to learn how to put quality systems in place. This is the kind of thing we like to see. We, want, we, we don't um, like to see these kinds of recalls. We like to see compliance. That's our goal. And seeing the industry really coming together, getting the message, that, that, that's uh, very important to us. Uh, now, Doctor, uh, your, your being here today goes far beyond uh, the McNeil Division of Johnson & Johnson. So let me ask a, a slightly different question. In the ordinary course, you try to visit uh, facilities here in the U.S. once every two years. But more and more uh, non-prescription drugs are being produced in China and other very far away places. Uh, and those places, in many cases, have a standard of simply lying on their paperwork. We've had that in, in a number of other areas. How do you propose that the FDA be able to ensure that a foreign manufacturer in a country where we have a fairly opaque ability to go beyond what the papers presented at the factory, that we can rely on those test results and as such the medicine that comes from them? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, the safety of imports is extremely important to us and uh, Dr. Hamburg has addressed, uh, has raised these very similar sorts of concerns in some major speeches and we had a hearing in the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on, on Health not too long ago where this got a fair amount of attention. Um, it's a concern for us and there are certain things that we need to be able to do better. Um, uh, included among those is holding each person in the supply chain accountable. Um, and that there are some tools that would allow us to do that. Um, in addition, we need to significantly expand our coordination with other agencies. We now have two foreign offices in China that um, coordinate with other agencies. And um, for example, if Australia does an inspection that we have confidence in, then we can go to another plant in Australia can have confidence in that inspection. Um, we also uh, need to strengthen the, and work. So you, what you're saying is your, part of your procedure would be to learn to inspect the inspectors to qualify countries or inspection techniques so that we could be somewhat reciprocal. Th that's absolutely true, both for our kind of uh, major partners um, in the developed world, but also we want to strengthen the um, indigenous uh, inspecting capacity and there's a big effort to do that in countries like China and India. Yeah, so I mean, it is a multi, yeah. it's a very complex right. problem and, and there are a lot of solutions. Let me just ask one final question and if it goes long I'd ask that it be answered for the record. Every day 45 foot, 53 foot containers of non-prescription drugs come in the country. Currently uh, our import authorities open only a fraction of those containers and when they do they open them to see if it's an aspirin and not much more. Do you believe here today that the Congress should begin creating both the authority and the mandate for at least sample inspection of 100 percent of these types of imports if they come from countries that you have not certified the certifiers? I believe that um, Congress and the FDA need to work together to really address the question of import safety. I'm not sure 100 percent testing is the answer. I think we need to have 100 percent accountability across the supply chain and a strong import border presence, but it's got to be addressed comprehensively. Okay, well, I would like you to answer for the record then the, the, the key question of if it comes from a country in which you mm -hmm. not have not achieved that level of confidence, no part of the supply chain, chain can change the fact that if any one of those bottles is bad and there has been no sampling, you will not have that public confidence. So I'd like you to tell us how you're going to get that confidence if you didn't get it in the country of origin mm -hmm. and now it's sitting in a container in the U.S. or going through the supply chain. And I'd ask you to answer that for the record. I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. My gentleman's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Trump, it's very good to see you again. 
and I say this without reservation, uh, when you served as the health commissioner for Baltimore where I live, uh, you did an outstanding job. You did it with excellence and integrity. And I have full faith and confidence in you. And so I wanted to say that before I got into these questions. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. There appears, Dr. Sharpstein, as I listen to your testimony, that uh, McNeil was involved in a culture of mediocrity. It seems that the, that the FDA had one standard and McNeil had another. And I'm trying to figure out where the two meet. In other words, we talk about, um, it sounds like a standard of McNeil. They said, okay, we got a little taint here, a little problem there, but we'll still mix it up. It'll be all right. FDA says, no, that's not good enough. Where does that, I mean, and, 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 and then you said something that was very interesting. You said there might be a need to uh, take further action. You said further action may be required. I'm trying to figure out how that all comes together when you've got a company that seems to be over and over again, be it by negligence, mm -hmm. intent, greed, or whatever skirting the system, but you got the FDA saying we've got this standard. I mean, where, how does that work? How does that come together? You follow sure. what I'm saying? Uh, absolutely. And you know, there's a real parallel to Baltimore because in Baltimore we inspected restaurants at the health department and um, we would uh, sometimes find problems and it, you know, there's always a balance between cooperation, working cooperatively with a business and taking action. And, most of the time we would find a problem and the business would jump and fix it and then we were done. But every so often there was a, a restaurant that we would have a significant problem with. We eventually got to the point where for some people we took away their license to run a restaurant in Baltimore, their ability to do that. And it's a balance. And I think if you look at the, this experience with McNeil, you see that, that FDA is pointing things out. Uh, McNeil is uh, sort of correcting them, waiting a little bit of time in some cases to tell us about problems. And over time, FDA is ratcheting up the oversight like we would do in Baltimore, where we would say, wait a second, you know, this should have been corrected in a restaurant and we're going to have to go back again and eventually we're going to have to bring them in and eventually we're going to bring them to the administrative judge. That's basically what FDA is doing. And the, the story of this whole episode is that FDA you know, increased the pressure, increased the pressure, brought in the corporate executives and wound up forcing, I think you'll hear very major changes in the company's approach to quality. We are going to use this as an opportunity to see what, you know, we can improve. Well, let but me, let uh, me but I think you. overall it, it is a tough balance that, that the FDA has to strike. Let me ask you this. In your testimony you state that in February 2010 FDA took the extraordinary, extraordinary step, you said, mm -hmm. a meeting with the management of Johnson Johnson to express uh, your concern about a pattern of non-compliance. Why was this meeting considered so extraordinary? What was extraordinary about it were two things. First of all, we went over the heads of the whole company. I mean, McNeil is a pretty big company, but we went to the actual, you know, corporate central head of the entire major company to, to, um, to express this concern. Um, so that, that's, that's one reason why it's extraordinary. The second thing is it wasn't about, usually we meet about specific problems, and this was a meeting about a culture of compliance that we'd seen so many problems at different facilities and problems that really concerned us that we really were calling them on their whole quality system and it led to major changes I think you'll hear at the company they you know um, people were moved in their positions or removed from their positions they have a whole new layer I believe you'll hear and um, I think that those were the two things that made it extraordinary, that we went over their heads and that we talked about the culture of compliance at the company, not just individual problems. Now, how did Johnson & Johnson react to what you said? They were present at the meeting, were they not? They was, were, Okay, yes. and what, what was their reaction? I, I believe, and my understanding is that they took it quite seriously. They, they heard that FDA, that this was not a usual kind of meeting for the FDA to have. Um, they'd gotten one of the fastest warning letters ever from what happened in Puerto Rico. Um, we, we issued a warning letter in which we call, the warning letter itself mentioned the fact that there was a failure of oversight by not just McNeil and Johnson and Johnson. And I think based on the changes they committed to at that point, we, we got the sense that, that, that they'd heard our concern, um, although we, we made very clear that we weren't going to take their word for it. And what does all of this say about a corporation 
I mean, all of you, you, I mean, apparently you did, you've gone pretty far with this corporation. What does it say about this corporation? I mean, have you drawn a conclusion? Well, you know, most of the companies that FDA deals with do um, do comply, and you know, there are some great examples out there of terrific compliance programs. This is a company that had a major problem with compliance, and it it was a. a, a problem that crossed different domains, different facilities, and was a systematic problem at the company. That, that's something FDA needs to be able to identify and address um, with the company, with its, with its uh, you know, um, senior leadership. And uh, we have to be willing, and in this case, I think we did really call them to account for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield um, five minutes to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chafee. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, in a moment, uh, uh, Ms. Groggins is going from uh, Johnson & Johnson is about to testify, and in her written testimony she says, quote, the health risks to consumers from the recalled products were remote, end quote. Is that true or false, and from your opinion? I, I think that is uh, also FDA's uh, understanding right now. Next uh, thing she says, second, McNeil, McNeil has no indication of a serious adverse medical event caused by any of the issues referenced in the recalled announcement. In your opinion, is that accurate? Um, well, I, I can't speak to what McNeil knows. The FDA does not have evidence of that kind of severe um, uh, event, although we are continuing to investigate certain cases. She says, quote, third, no raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of McNeil's pediatric products, end quote. Is that true or? I say that that's sort of true, maybe with an sort asterisk. Of true? Yeah, with an, you know, I would say what is sort or, of true. W w w you know, with a footnote. The footnote being, they did use raw materials from lots that had tested positive. There were some negative tests um, for the parts of those lots that they used, but FDA does not consider that an adequate assurance of safety. And fine quote. And finally, McNeil rejected the products that it found to have that. Sorry. And finally, McNeil rejected the products that it found had excess active ingredient, end quote. Would you agree with that statement or disagree with that statement? Um, again, I would say I agree with the footnote. When they knew those particular lots um, uh, had excess ingredients, they, they rejected them. But I think that we felt that um, they didn't test other parts of that area to be sure that there wasn't a problem in other uh, ingredient that was shipped. Now, my understanding is the let me just uh, let me just see if Deb uh, sure. wants to qualify that. Yeah, just to clarify that, uh, with the potency issue, what happened was that McNeil made a change in their manufacturing process and the size of the vat they were using without testing whether the product would adequately mix once that change was made. So they produced 11 batches uh, using that new process. Three of them tested to be super potent. They threw away those three, but from our perspective, there's no assurance that the other eight wouldn't have the same potency issues. They did some testing. They didn't find potency, but because the process hadn't been tested, there was potential that there were potency problems in the other batches, even though uh, they hadn't tested that way. It, it, I appreciate the efforts of the FDA, and, and, and I love the fact that they're ahead of the, ahead of the uh, uh, ball. But having found no serious adverse reaction is the FDA overreacting to this? I mean, there are 775 serious side effects. So where on the spectrum is this to what you're usually dealing with? How severe is this problem and issue? Mm. Well, I think there, uh, let me answer that in a couple ways. The, the side effects are, were reported about the medications, and we think that some of them were linked to the actual medications used, right. not the quality problems. Um, and I think the number of adverse events, are, we probably have to separate a little bit from the quality problems. We consider that these quality problems to be quite significant, and we want to fix them before it becomes a point where we're counting the problem in hospitalizations and injuries instead of in bottles recalled. <laughs> the, uh, what's a mom supposed to do? You've had hundreds of millions of products recalled. Uh, how many of those have actually made it to somebody's, you know, beyond the store shelf and actually into somebody's cupboard and they're sitting there? What, what's mom supposed to do at home? Well, uh, we had some in our house. Um, I think uh, we, we, we recommend that people throw out the ones that they have, that you can find out which, which ones they are from uh, the website and other information, what and is, that, what, that, what is, that they can go to the store and, and get alternatives. 
So if you have any of these products, you're supposed to, on your shelf, you're supposed to actually go back to the store, or is there a when you say the website, how does that work? Is there a lot number on the bottom that they can go check and then there FDA is website? and yes, uh, I'm, I you know um, McNeil has actually set up a phone number for people to call to get instructions, and they, they may answer better the how they're handling that part of it, but there are um, instructions for people to be able to uh, um, turn back their medication. And finally, were you at the meeting, were you, either any of you at those meetings in February? I no, I think that uh, uh, Ms. Otter um, was the one who called for the meeting, but I don't think any of us were at the meeting. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank you very much. I now yield um, five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. Uh, in your testimony, you referenced a 2010 report which identified a six-year-old child who died. Now, prior to uh, the child's death, uh, according to this report, the child had been given several products manufactured at the facilities in question. Mm -hmm. uh, did any of those products that the child uh, took contain a harmful bacteria? Um, not, no, as far as we know. Those were tested and we did not see any of the bacteria. And uh, what was the cause of death? Uh, I, I uh, let me see. I have. I want to be sure whether we have this. I think that there's still an open coroner's investigation, so I'm not sure they have a final uh, cause of death. It, when, I, when, I may, when, it may have been the, um, when was the infection. Uh, January. Have you seen any toxicology screens from this uh, autopsy report? Have you seen the autopsy report? I'm not sure that we have the final autopsy report. That's what it would be, that if the coroner's investigation is open, we probably don't have the final report. I understand that, it, that there was this bacteria found in multiple um, tissues. Uh, of which the, of which the bacteria was found in the multiple tissues? Uh, Burkholia cepacea. And is that was that bacteria found in any of the samples that the FDA uh, picked up of the products that uh, were recalled? No. No, it, 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 that bacteria was not found in, in the products that this child apparently consumed. It was not found in any finished product that we know of, but it was the same bacteria that was involved in the, in the ingredient issue that the company had. So does the FDA have a pathologist on its staff? Um, I'm, I'm, I couldn't tell you 100%. Do you, outs do you outsource? Uh, pathology reviews? Well, we do have medical officers who would be qualified to review pathology reports. Are they, are they certified, you know, in, uh, in terms of pathology? Are they pathologists or do they just review? I'd pathology? have to get back to you on that exact question, but we do have people who, who are qualified to review pathology and, and judge um, whether or not uh, we were concerned about a link between a product and a particular death. Why was the report even included in testimony if it doesn't seem to rise to the level of significance uh, according to your uh, answers here? Well, I, I use it as an example of how seriously we take reports like this. I mean, we went out, we tested the products, we actually went back and reviewed the records. Um, uh, again, at each of the facilities where uh, that were involved, because they had taken products from the two facilities, and you know, we, we don't reach. A, it's really two lines of evidence that we use. One is our assessment of the manufacturing problem, and other is a thorough investigation of the adverse event reports that we get, and that was an example of one. Uh, when is something, uh, by your consideration, the result of an adverse event that's in a uh, that's a uh, well understood to be a contraindication of the of taking of a drug, and on the other hand, uh, an adulterated product. How do you make the distinction? Um, it, it, it's a good question. It partly depends on the specific situation. So, for example, in some of the cases that were reported, there were toxic levels of the medicine, you know, uh, of a variety of medicines in. Um, and, and there's a history of the child maybe getting extra doses. That, that is a, a, a known problem for certain over-the-counter medicines. When you get the autopsy, will you get the autopsy report on the six-year-old child who, who died? Would you will expect we? to get it? Oh, yeah, I believe so, sure. Will you, can you share it with this committee? Um, I'm, I'm sure we would, we would do that, yes. And, and could I ask you, uh, to your knowledge, does anyone who is at the FDA uh, have they ever gone over and worked for Johnson & Johnson or McNeil? 
Uh, is there anybody over there at uh, Johnson Johnson McNeil who used to work for the FDA? Um, I couldn't say for sure, but I would guess probably there are people who have. And, and is there anyone uh, at, uh, uh, who used to work at Johnson & Johnson or McNeil who now works for the FDA? I, have, uh, I don't know that for sure, but it's possible. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you all for being here with us today. Um, just, to, just to be clear for the record, kind of picking up where uh, Mr. Uh, the, the cause and effect has, has caused by product from McNeil or, or Johnson & Johnson? By the product, not the product quality issue. Um, Yes, I believe that there are adverse events that are known to be caused by the product. There are a lot of adverse events that happen in medicine and often they're linked to the actual pharmaceutical itself because all medicines have risks and benefits, but not anything linked to the product quality issues that we're talking okay. about here. Okay. I just want to be clear on that. And have you looked at any of the recalled product? Have you tested that to see if there's the bad stuff in there, any of the, any of the product that's been taken off the shelf? Um, we did in the course of some of these investigations of individual adverse events, but generally other than that, we, we generally don't do that. And, and, and why not? I mean, in this situation, why not? Well, we believe that um, if there needs to be a recall because of the testing that's been done demonstrates a problem, then it should just be recalled. There's okay. no need for us to do it. No need to mm -hmm. check it out. Okay. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm struck by it. seems to me, if, if I follow the timeline right, you, you you uh, did the warning letter in January. You had the inspection of the uh, Pennsylvania facility, I believe, in, in April. Um, and then you've had, you know, the recalls and the stoppages and everything else. It seems to me the, the process, and you had the meeting uh, where it seemed like that you, you, you indicated that, that meeting, even though you, you all weren't there, that you felt that was positive and productive. Um, I mean, I contrast what, what, we've, what we're hearing about here and, and what we've seen with uh, frankly, what we're, what we're hearing about in the Gulf Coast with MMS, or MMA, I guess it is, the Mineral Management S service, and, um, and their relationship with the industry, it seems to me this, this process is, is working much better uh, than, than what, we're, what we're seeing and hearing about in, in another area of government. Would you, I mean, do you, do you think the process is working uh, appropriately? I, I think as I testified that if you look what, what happened here, you had um, a, a team, actually both part of uh, Mr. Chappell's organization and Ms. Otter's organization, career inspectors at FDA who were very vigilant with this company, identified the problem, called them to account, and it led to major changes to protect the public. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for yielding back. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Washington, D.C., Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. Five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Dr. Shrubstein, uh, I, 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 listening to your testimony and the action taken, I want to commend you for what it looks like <laughs> effective action by an administrative uh, agency. Um, I'd like to ask you about this notion of superpotency. I think about uh, when my kids were young, <clears throat> if I had read that something I was giving them was found by FDA to have something called super potency, I would have been immediately fearful. Um, I, I'd like to know what it takes for a product to be super potent and as a physician, a former public uh, health commissioner, um, whether you think uh, um, such potency could result in uh, health effects at some later point, what does it mean? Sure. How did how did it manifest itself? It's an excellent question. Um, there's a range of the amount of material in a drug that we expect to be in a particular dose, and um, in this case, I think it was up to about 108 percent we expect to be there. And um, when they tested certain lots, they found up to 124 um, percent with what they were expecting. So let's say there's supposed to be 100 milligrams in there. Um, any particular lot, we would say it's acceptable. It doesn't have to be exactly 100 milligrams. It could be up to 108. 
but what they found was up to 124. Now they threw out those lots, but we weren't assured that some of the ones that did ship were, were okay because of what um, Ms. Otter said about their new process. So what happened was both at FDA and at the company, we looked, we assessed whether or not this problem, if it had been there, if we, we don't have proof that anything shipped that was super potent, but if it had been there, would that oppose a risk? And that evaluation was done by physicians within FDA and by um, uh, doctors within McNeil. And for a number of reasons, the conclusion was this would not oppose to risk. It's a relatively small increase. It was one formulation, actually, of the dropper for little babies. And um, Tylenol and acetaminophen um, is actually something that, uh, particularly in adults, you can get into trouble and people get liver problems if they get overdoses on. Um, but if there are a number of reasons uh, why for babies, actually babies are much less likely to get that problem. And it turns out it has to do with the the way that the chemicals metabolized in, in children's livers. Um, so that gives you one margin of safety, and then you have a whole other margin of safety just because 20% really isn't a big increase in the scheme of toxicology that you're looking for two or three times the dose to start to get into trouble. So for all those reasons, we felt that the risk was very, very low of a problem. Uh, that's comforting, um, <laughs> but particularly since we know that adults can get in trouble with, the, with these with these uh, medicines in adult doses to know that somehow children, uh, and I, we understand these, uh, 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 these, these uh, effects can be different. I have to ask you though, uh, as a physician, uh, these um, medicines for children and infants are very controversial. And I'm looking at uh, an ad mm -hmm. for one of them, uh, 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 and it says infants, pediatrician's choice. Are these effective enough to take the risk I mean, every time a child has a sniffle, you ought to run for one of these infants' <laughs> doses of, of medicines that weren't even available until fairly recently? Well, I, I think for particularly small babies, it's important to, for patients to talk about uh, with their doctors about the use of medications. Uh, Congressman Cummings knows that I personally um, have a history with some of these products of concern about whether they should be used for young children and um, I petitioned the agency as the health commissioner of Baltimore about them and I'm recused from that issue at FDA now. Um, but uh, I do think that it's important for, for patients to talk to their doctors about the use of medicines. You know, uh, that I, as I certainly use Tylenol and um, ibuprofen, acetaminophen for children. For infants? For infants? Doc? For infants under certain circumstances. Yes. Um, but it, it, you know, they're but it, it really is something that as a doctor I would say, particularly to parents of small babies, that it's very important that we be in touch. If you're giving medicine because you're worried about your child, I would say, I want to know about it so we can decide whether that was the right uh, response. Dr. Sharfstein, let me ask you about a statement in your testimony. I'm looking at page 10. You say FDA is, is considering additional enforcement actions against the company for its pattern of noncompliance, which may include seizure, injunction, and criminal penalties. These are nuclear penalties. Um, does FDA need more effective penalties? I don't think you're going to go around seizing uh, companies uh, or even seizing large batches and mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to be quick to run to court to get injunctions and you may and you, we've not seen criminal penalties yet. Do you have the graduation of penalties necessary to be effective here beyond the effectiveness you've already shown? Uh, I, th I think that's a very fair question to ask. I'll point out that in the um, food safety bill, uh, Congress is looking at giving FDA the ability to assess civil money penalties, which would be one of those graduated steps. So you have no such, you have no such, uh, you have no such authority now? I, I believe not, but I'll... Not for drugs, no. A a that is authority you would like to have. Uh, you know, the administration has, th that, that position sort of working its way through the process, but the administration supports that for food. Gentlewoman's time has expired. Um, before I go to, um, uh, I just want to clear up something, Dr. Sharfstein. Mm -hmm. uh, when my staff and, and the ranking member staff um, uh, earlier this week, they were told that the recall exists, I think it was 6 million bottles. I believe you said 136 million bottles. What, what number are we using here? I understand that there was a recall of about um, six to eight million bottles last year in 2009. That was the 2009 recall, but that this, 
this recall was the much bigger, over 100 million bottles. That's my understanding. Uh, this recall was about was over 136 million bottles. Um, the recall last year relating to uh, the chemical contamination that Dr. Sharfstein mentioned, uh, by our numbers, was over 60 million. Uh, and then the year before, the recall relating to um, the potentially contaminated raw material was 8 million bottles. That wasn't the year before, that was a couple months before. Uh, a couple, yeah, I'm sorry, a couple months before in early, in August of 2009. All right. Thank you very much for correcting mm -hmm. the record. I now yield five minutes to Mr. Lukemeyer of Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I've been listening to the discussion this morning, it, it seems to me that we have a situation where, um, you know, we, we've gone through this and we had a six-year-old that, that passed away, but it wasn't necessarily due to the, the drugs that were in question here today. Um, <clears throat> your own FDA report indicates that uh, recall drugs pose a remote potential problem for serious health, serious health problems. Um, but yet, McNeil found their own problems. Um, one of your comments a while ago, doctor, indicated that it was that McNeil, uh, uh, that the operation was not up to McNeil's standards. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? They have their own set of standards and you have FDA standards. Is their That's correct. Uh, higher than your standards or lower than your standards? Well, part of what good manufacturing practices are is that a company has to set its own standards. So that's are something every higher, company has to do. Are they higher than FDA standards or lower than FDA standards? Well, part of FDA's standard is for the company to sort of, they work together. So part of FDA's standards are for the company to set standards for its product. Okay. Um, so it seems as though we've got a problem here. You know, McNeil, correct me if I'm wrong, they did the recall on their own. Is that correct? That's correct. We do not have so mandatory they, so recall they, authority. So they found the problem. They, they, they realized they've got a problem. And they went out and did the recall on their own. So it would appear to me that we've got a, a situation where it looks like we've got a sloppy shop mm. that found they, they're, they're doing poor work and are, are going to try and correct it themselves. And you're working with them to do that. Is that correct? Is that pretty well framing it? I, I think that's basically true. I think that what was particularly troubling in the story to FDA is that there was a pattern of FDA finding out about things late. You know, that the, this issue, you know, people were complaining that the, the product smelled bad for a year before they told FDA about it and it turned out there was a chemical coming in through the pallet. And, um, and it, it should not have taken a year, it should have taken three days for us to hear about it. And the recall in 2010, part of that recall, was related to something that happened in 2009 that the company should have been able to figure out. So it's, you know, I, I do think that we, particularly over this period, um, I believe that the company has gotten the message from FDA and I believe that they are really um, improving and I think you'll hear about that. But I do believe FDA's oversight was very important to them. Has, have you found any problem with co-dosing or over, uh, uh, you know, t taking more than the, the prescribed amount with the people that you've had uh, complaints with? Uh, has that been a problem at all with regards to this, some of the drugs you looked into with this, this group? Um, well, th these are over the counter, so they're generally not prescribed. But you mean, I, I, do, I do think in general for these types of medicines, um, you know, overdosages are just generally an issue. But that, nothing that I know for this that would make it a particular issue. Okay. But my question is, as you're looking at some of the uh, I think adverse events that you're, you're describing here. Yes. Are, are in those events, any, are there instances of co-dosing? Are there instances of over? Oh, absolutely, over, yes. Over, mm -hmm. okay. That's um, are those things then that um, are part of, uh, you know, whenever you get your little uh, labeling and you get your little uh, pamphlet that goes along with your drugs, mm -hmm. is that information in there so that if an uh, individual wants to, because these are other counter drugs, if the individual mm -hmm. has to read it themselves to be able to see that they're they're not going to interact with something inappropriately. Is that information there? Or were, were these drugs something that were not part of uh, the, the description that was released along with the, the drug itself? Um, no, I, I think that in general the, the drugs are labeled with their ingredients and people should be able to see those. It's complicated for some of these products because um, they may have multiple ingredients and people may not immediately realize that if they're giving you know, one medication and another that they actually have the same underlying ingredients. And, and that kind of confusion has been one of the issues in this field. But um, 
you know, and, and I think it's something that FDA is, is working with the industry on. So you're looking at further labeling or further uh, advertisement well, about this? You know, I probably shouldn't go further because this is the area that I'm a little bit, uh, I, I'm recused from in part because of the uh, petition that I wrote when I was the Baltimore City Health Commissioner, but FDA is looking at the labeling and the appropriate um, handling of this class of medicines in the cough and cold arena. Okay, with, it, with these adverse events, were any of them with regards to over um, are taking more than the prescribed amount of this medication? Um, more than the labeled amount, I believe, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So between the two of them, co-dosing and over, uh, over the taking more than prescribed or, or suggested, how, what percentage of, of the total number of adverse events would you apply to those two different groups? I'd have to get back to you on that. I couldn't, okay. I couldn't answer that. In uh, a, um, I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. I thank the chair, and I, uh, I certainly welcome all of the concern of members of the committee uh, about this tragedy. It's too bad not everybody in the committee could find their way to voting to give FDA mandatory recall authority. And that, uh, that is, uh, I think, the crux of what we're talking about here today. Mr. Chairman, this committee has held uh, many important and groundbreaking hearings in its history. <coughs> None more important than this. Why? Because 37 children are dead due to a tainted product, a product that parents relied on, a product they trusted to be safe, both because of the brand name and the expectation that the FDA ensured its safety through re federal regulatory and oversight statutes. Whoever is responsible, everyone involved, failed those 37 families in a profound and tragic way, including us. This story is part of a much broader and equally tragic pattern characterized by anti-government rhetoric, laissez-faire laws and policies, and deliberate non or lax enforcement of existing laws and regulations, <coughs> especially during the Bush administration. In the last six weeks, we've witnessed the unfolding drama of multiple examples of the effects and consequences of this laissez-faire philosophy of government a mine tragedy in West Virginia with a number of deaths and one prominent <coughs> advocate of the laissez-faire approach actually reacting by stating sometimes accidents happen, even though there's strong evidence lax mine safety enforcement had something to do with that tragedy. The BP oil well that has spilled at least four times the oil leaked in Exxon Valdez was exempted from regulation by the Minerals Management Service from the normal National Environmental Policy Act regulations. Result, an oil slick the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined, threatening the single largest fishery and source of seafood in the United States. No need for health insurance reform? Tell that to the breast cancer victims who were systematically targeted by the largest insurer in the United States for rescission of all coverage. And what could go wrong with lax enforcement of oversight on Wall Street? The steepest recession in 80 years, 8.5 million Americans losing their jobs, the largest government bailout in American history, and the loss of 17.5 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars worth of aggregate wealth in the United States. And now 37 children dead because a contaminated product could not be detected and mandatorily recalled by the regulatory agency in question in a timely fashion. There is certainly a difference between these two philosophies of government. One offers protections to the public through reasonable regulation and strict oversight and enforcement, and the other leads us tragically, as we've seen in these last few weeks, to nothing short of the law of the jungle. I yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, statement. Uh, I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Westmoreland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Dr. Sharfstein, I have uh, seven grandchildren, and uh, we they spend the night with us on a regular basis, and so we have a cabinet full of children's uh, mm -hmm. uh, medicine. And my wife and I, after the recall, went and looked and saw that some of it needed to be taken out. Could you tell me who manufactures the CVS brand uh, infant uh, um, similar medicine or maybe the Walmart um, equivalent uh, brand. Uh, 
I, I don't know if I could tell you off the top of my head. I think that there, there may be a number of manufacturers there. One of them was mentioned earlier that does supply for, this, uh, for the, the, that, that market, um, but that there may be more than one. Because I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, certain companies make all the products and just put different labels on them or have different uh, specs. So you don't know who actually, uh, since McNeil manufactures about, or at least has about a 70% market share, right. would we be safe going to buy a CVS or, or, or Walmart not actually knowing who manufactured it? Or have you had... I mean, do you, well, do you know that? FDA knows who manufactured it. I don't, just don't know off the top of my head. But I think, you know, one of the things we were talking about is that uh, FDA does inspect those facilities too, and FDA does not, has not identified the kinds of problems um, at those facilities, and that's why they're on the market. Okay. Do you know how many labels McNeil manufacturers for? Um, yes, we do know that, and we know that the all the products that, um, of concern have been recalled. There's been some question, I guess, about the availability of these products for this, and, and that's one of the concerns that my wife had was, well, where are we going to get it from? You know, I mean, what is it? Is there a sufficient amount of product on the market right now to where people can feel comfortable um, that they would have the medication for the young children? Yes, uh, the drug shortage team at FDA looked at that around the time of this recall and felt like there, there would be adequate alternatives um, for uh, uh, the medications that had been recalled. And if you put out a list of what those uh, might be, or is it anything but? Um, I think that, you know, for uh, it's what's available in the stores because the other ones have been pulled off. And um, we do have a shortage team that is looking to see, even though it looks like there's enough across the country, if there's a spot shortage in a particular location, our team can help direct the supplies and work with the companies to direct the supplies to alleviate a spot shortage. But that is something that we were concerned about, but given the fact that the facility is such a large supplier to the market. Okay. With that, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would the gentleman yield? I uh, will. I'll yield. I thank the gentleman. Doctor, uh, Mr. Connolly seemed to imply that the previous eight years uh, before you came to this job that uh, the FDA wasn't doing their job. Do you know of any of that? Well, I, I think that, as I testified before, you know, we have not identified a case of a serious adverse event linked to these, these no, quality problems. that wasn't my question. Mm -hmm. Mr. Connolly implied that the Bush administration didn't care about safety, that, uh, that somehow this, the, those eight years were not good. You're heading, as a political appointee, mm -hmm. but you're heading a organization that, if I understand correctly, is almost all non-political appointees. Isn't that correct? That, that is correct. So how would you rate the agency, the FDA, at the time you came from a standpoint of professionalism and consistency of inspecting with the intent of food safety, food and drug safety? Well, personally, I've been incredibly impressed with the people at the FDA. There are, you know, thousands of professionals uh, with backgrounds in medicine, law, they're inspectors, they're chemists, and the work they do is because they really care about the mission of the agency. I do think that um, one of the messages that Dr. Hamburg has sent as the commissioner in major speeches that she is going to place a, uh, an emphasis on enforcement and compliance, that she believes it's very important, and she's really made the pitch to industry that it supports industry when, when that happens, and that's been something that she's sure, focused and on. That probably is very similar to what her predecessor said when, when they came in, but I just want everyone to understand for the record, this is an organization that the vast majority of it is controlled by career professionals, scientists, physicians who, who, who do their job and who may, within the limits of the laws and the funding we give them, in fact, do the same job whether it's a Republican or a Democratic administration. Isn't that true? Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here with two terrific professionals from the agency who've worked across multiple administrations. Well, then why don't we, why don't we go to those two and mm -hmm. just answer, do you see this as a dramatic change in the last two years, or is this essentially the same organization it was two years ago? The gentleman's time has expired. I will yield him an additional minute. You know, uh, the gentleman from Ohio, where is he, he who controls the time, where is he? The gentleman oh, from uh, Lynn, from G Georgia. But just Georgia. basically, it, because yeah. the statement was made, I just would like the career professionals to answer if, in fact, this is substantially the same organization with the same mission and the same level of care. 
I would say that uh, FDA, as you said, has thousands of very hardworking career professionals who did very hard work uh, and do regardless of the administration. I think that uh, we welcome this administration's focus on enforcement and compliance and are glad to see that. And we will continue to do everything we can to ensure the safety, quality, and integrity of the drug supply. Right. Thank you. I'd concur in that and also say, as, as Dr. Sharfstein has said, when Dr. Hamburg arrived and rein, reinforced the fact that enforcement was one of our major tools, obviously that was, that was an issue that we have always dealt with and also were encouraged by that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time from Georgia has expired. I uh, now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Congressman Thank you Watson. so much, Mr. Chairman. I think this is a very crucial and essential uh, hearing that you're having today, and we all are concerned about the 775 adverse effects that have been reported through uh, Dr. Sharpestein's uh, office and the deaths that have occurred because of some of the products that can be uh, purchased over the counter. And so, uh, Carding, and this is directed to you, uh, Dr. Sharp. Let me pronounce your name correctly, Sharpstein? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. According to McNeil, no raw material that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of their products. However, according to the Form 483 filed uh, after the FDA's April inspection of the Fort Washington facility, the raw material samples pulled from testing are not statistically significant enough to be a representative sample of that total. So here's the question. What does McNeil need to do to improve their sampling methods? And what kinds of bacteria were discovered in the raw materials? And what are <laughs> the health implications for children and for infants who might have consumed the contaminated products? Sure, I'm happy to address that. What McNeil needed to do and what they eventually did is have a process where if the bacteria was found in any part of a lot of this substance that they not use the whole lot. What they started to do is they would use part of the lot that tested okay, but the test, the sampling wasn't good enough to assure that. So they have now a new policy, they don't take any of the lot and that's the right policy to have. Did we pull those products off the shelves or did they pull them off the shelves? Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, representatives from Johnson & Johnson have stated that McNeil is committed to not restarting operations until it has taken the necessary corrective uh, actions and to ensure the safety and quality of their products. And what do you think are the most critical changes that McNeil needs to make before the American people can trust the integrity of their medicines again? That's an excellent question. I think there's there's a broad answer to that question, which is that McNeil needs to put in a very strong quality system that has some very important basic components to it, um, where they will, where, where not only will things be done correctly, but they have a strong way of catching if there's a problem, investigating what that problem is, and immediately solving that. And that approach is what FDA is going to really insist on to be in place before the facility starts manufacturing again. I see. Now, do you have the authority to pull these products off the shelf? And I wasn't clear with the uh, testimony that preceded. Um, uh, FDA does not have the authority to require recalls. Now, we, we, under certain circumstances, we can go to court and get seizures and injunctions and other things. But in terms of a mandatory recall authority for drugs, FDA does not have that authority. Um, the process of going to court. Mm -hmm. is in some cases time consuming. Absolutely. And uh, how can we help with FDA? I have another issue and we had a hearing yesterday. It deals with mercury amalgams. I don't want to get into that. That took us five hours. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what authority we can provide to you so that we can take these questionable products off the shelf. Lives are at stake here and you've testified. Well. To, um, one of the things to um, uh, know is that in the food safety bill, um, 
that Congress is, is looking to give FDA mandatory recall authority over foods, um, also authority to put in place and um, require certain types of preventive standards to prevent problems, uh, access to records, easier access for FDA to records of companies, uh, and civil let money me just penalties. Interject this question. Uh, you're saying authority over foods. Can we add another line saying anything that is ingested or digested through the mouth? Um, I that, think that, that would be up to Congress, right? Foods. Right, that would be up to okay. Congress. I, I think, in the, but I'm. As I, a doctor, would that be, would that clarify what you need to understand we can do? Uh, I want to make it easier for you. Uh, to I, I, indicate. I appreciate the question yeah, and tremendously. And we make the policy, so. Right, no, absolutely. The administration doesn't, hasn't uh, worked out a final position on this with respect to drugs, but we, the administration does have a position with respect to foods, and, and these are the types of things that the administration is looking at with respect to foods, and there's no you know, question that um, it's, it's relevant for drugs. Okay, I'm going to have yeah. my staff write a letter to you, and we're going to suggest this language, and then you can take it the rest of the way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll leave the record open up. for it. Yes, uh, now I yield five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, Doctor, let me first thank you very much for a very measured response, a very measured and, and thoughtful approach to this, this issue. <clears throat> I think it's so quick for us to want to go from one radical extreme to the other, and I appreciate the fact that I think you were, some people would say your experience here, I think your experience in the real world doing local health gives you that, that measure of moderation and consistency and uh, I think that that really helps the entire process. When you were, um, one of the things that I really want to uh, focus on is that we've talked about how do we respond to this and, and as you said, we sort of address the issue before it became chronic, before it became a crisis. As we look at the way we can improve this, I've got some questions about your auditors when they go in. <clears throat> the, um, how do you assign the, um, the inspectors for, um, to do these inspections for the facilities? They come out of the, the district office. FDA has a number of district offices around the country, and um, they have staff of inspectors. So that the firms are inspected by their local district office professional inspectors. Okay. Do does the same inspector go back and inspect these facilities each time, or is there a rotation? Do you know how they allocate uh, personnel towards certain facilities? Um, I'm gonna. Maybe ask Mike Chappell, who oversees all the inspectors, to answer that question. Well, thank you, Tim. In response to your question, we make sure that the individuals that conduct these inspections have the proper level of training and experience. Indeed, if they're in a firm where there are some significant problems, they also uh, are able to call upon expertise both within uh, the inspectional group and also other places in the agency. We don't have a policy that the uh, same invest investigator can't go into the same firm. Oftentimes they do, but in, in many of the cases of these large firms, there'll actually be a team of inspectors that'll go in just, to the, just due to the just sheer size of the firm. So in other words, too, you, you have a policy that you may have an inspector go in with a general oversight, but if he finds specific concerns, he can then call in sort of a delta team that specializes and to help him focus on some of the concerns and bring a level of expertise up a little bit on those specific issues? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. If there's a, a specific manufacturing process or a specific issue that we have other people with greater expertise or experience, they are available to be called in for these inspections, yes. Now when we, uh, we talk about the inspectors and their relationships with the facility itself, what is the policy and what is the practical application of communication contact with the facility or individuals who operate the facility by the inspectors other than during inspection, other than during the official uh, process of review and inspection of the facilities, off, um, as we say, off-campus contacts. What, what is the policy and what is the reality in uh, what level of contacts off-campus or out of the inspection process do these inspectors have with operators or owners of these facilities? I would say that there is quite um, a lot of communication between the company and its district office, and maybe Mike, if you want to 
I mean, talk about some of the examples. If they find problems in the facility, for example, it's not during an inspection, there's certain types of problems they have to notify the district office about. Uh, just to make sure I understand your question, are you talking about an, ins an inspector or investigator that is not conducting an inspection that has no relationship with that company as it relates to an inspection or investigation? Yeah, I just wonder, if, I'm really looking at, and uh, Dr. That's, that's one side to look of the, through the official communications. But what I'm saying is, what is the policy about unofficial contacts the, that may not be directly related to the responsibility of, of the inspector to the, to the facility, but outside of official contact? What kind of policy do you have specific to oh. those, um, those contacts outside of official um, I see. I'm sorry. I may have misunderstood the that's question. That's okay. You're, 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 you're asking sort of about like after hours, right. contacts, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Not, I thought you meant outside of the inspections, but I not outside that. of the job. But you mean outside the job, Mike, do you want to? Yeah. Well, I, I can certainly say there's professional integrity that we expect of our investigators. And if they're involved in activities with uh, company officials as, as it relates to some type of of, of relationships such as a job seeking, et cetera. We have standards for that that pr prohibits that kind of activity. Okay. I appreciate that. And you know, Doctor, I had the pleasure for a decade at supervising a environmental health department doing this kind of inspection and an air resources district doing this kind of inspection. And there's two schools of thought. And I think too often people take the punitive approach that I had my air district was involved with for too long rather than a cooperative. And one thing I was very impressed with our environmental health people was they saw their job was to help the private sector stay within the law, stay within the safety boundary, and rather than what I ran into with a lot of my air guys that were looking for the cop mentality of trying to catch people crossing the line and being punitive rather than cooperative. And I know people will attack you for trying to work with the private sector at staying within the framework, but I think we all remember um, busting people or finding fault is not the Gentlemen's answer, but to time avoid the expired. problem. And I appreciate your effort. Gentlemen's effort. time has expired. Well, did that, uh, Mr. Chairman, could I allow the, the doctor to um, comment on that before we? Well, sure, sure. I would say I, I absolutely agree with that, and that was uh, the approach we had in Baltimore. We, we, it's very important to 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 work cooperatively where you can, and we in Baltimore actually had a, a website where we posted common questions so that people could get information. Our goal was not to, you know, um, we weren't counting success by the number of closures, but we wanted to have success by compliance. And that's the same thing at FDA. And actually one of our transparency recommendations parallels that, that FDA should be more aggressive in telling the regulated community about the kinds of problems that we find so that people can correct them in advance, not whether we can find them in every place. Thank you very right. much, Mr. Chairman. Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from um, Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you and the ranking member for uh, holding this, this hearing uh, on a serious matter of public health and public safety. Uh, maintaining the highest standards for manufacturing medicine is essential uh, to the safety of the American consumer. So let me ask um, Dr. Sharfstein, um, I have two children, 9 and 16. Um, do you advise me as well as the, the rest of the people listening and viewing this hearing to stay away from these products? from Johnson & Johnson, from Motrin, from Tylenol, and whatever else you found to be problematic? We, we are advising that uh, people throw out the recalled products, yes. Uh, what about the the, uh, just the brand itself. No, I, I don't think we would go, I don't think we'd go that far because, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at each of the, you know, different issues at the different facilities, but there was a pretty big list of products that we're telling people to, to stay away from right now. You know, looking at, uh, at the observation from your first reports and then from your report in April of 2010, it appears that you observed many of the same deficiencies Again, is, 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 is this a correct assessment? I think that there, there were some similarities, but we found some new ones in, uh, in April 2010 that were, were extra concerning. Uh, in your opinion, how seriously did McNeil take his response to your inspections? I think that um, this, that what happened over this period is FDA gradually what, what was 
intensifying its scrutiny and that really culminated in this February meeting which was an extraordinary meeting with the senior leadership of the parent company where FDA really said there's a problem with compliance at your company and our sense is they took that very seriously and have made some major changes to how they oversee quality across their uh, this particular company. Um, you know, we wish it hadn't come to that, but I think it was necessary for FDA to really um, talk to the company about the company's overall compliance problems. Now, it is uh, my understanding that reports of suspicious odors uh, were made as early as 2008. Is that correct? That is correct. And how long did it take McNeil to begin a comprehensive response to these complaints? Uh, at, at least a year, I think. A year? That's correct. Okay, so they didn't take the report seriously. They didn't take the uh, complaint seriously. But, uh, you know, FDA's view is that they should have reported that to the agency and that they didn't at that time. Um, and then when they did report it to us, um, it, it required a lot of oversight by FDA for them to realize the scope of the problem and eventually that led to a, a significant recall and because of their failures in that regard, FDA sent them a warning letter on January 15th of this year that um, not only called attention to the problems but called attention to the failure of corporate oversight. So in, in, in FDA's opinion, their response was not timely nor appropriate. That's correct. Uh, do you believe that Johnson & Johnson's participation in recalling the contaminated pro product was effective? Um, I'm not, I'm, I, th I believe that they've gone about the recall, particularly this most recent recall, very vigorously. And they've you know, made a lot of information available to the public about it. What, uh, what new regulations do you believe should now be enacted to protect American consumers uh, from the contaminated medicines we are investigating today? What, what else can we do? One of the things we've been talking about are some of the authorities that FDA is uh, it, are being looked at under the food safety bill for food um, that relate to things like mandatory recall authority, easier access to records to FDA, civil money penalties. Those are things that have been discussed. Uh, do you believe that contamination of this magnitude has implications for possible terror threats? Terrorist threats? Um, I, I, I don't know if I can answer that question without thinking about it some more. Um, in general, um, this is really a product quality issue that we see and have seen, you know, for, for a while and, and FDA believes it's important, absent any, you know, just in general, it's important that products be made according to the best specifications so that they're as safe, as effective as possible and that, that's, it's really product quality that's driving our, our strong work in this area. And, and how often do you check quality control uh, these manufact with, with the manufacturer? It, it depends on the company and it depends on their record. And this is a company that got extra scrutiny from FDA because of our concerns. Uh, thank you. And I use time is fried. Before we move to the next um, uh, witness, I'm sorry, for the next uh, questioner, let me yield 30 seconds to the gentleman from California. I thank the gentleman. And to clarify the record, I'd ask unanimous consent to be able to place in the record uh, a, a letter from the McNeil Com Consumer uh, Health Care Division uh, in which they say call 800 or call 888-222-6036. And uh, I won't put this in the record, but if you do that, rather than throwing away uh, medicine, you return it and you're paid. Uh, $15 on this check. So uh, I would just ask that that be placed in the record and that it be clear that the recall does cause uh, this division to pay for he uh, health care products returned to them. Without objection, so ordered. I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Congress Chairman. Woman Speer. Along those same lines, um, let me ask um, FDA, do you have this telephone number on your website to alert the consuming public that they can contact McNeil and get reimbursed? I, I believe we do. I believe that we link to all of uh, McNeil's materials and Well, website I don't want, I'm not talking about linking, but actually having a notice on your website to call this number mm. and that you can then get a reimbursement. I'd have and to if you don't, quadruple I think you check. Should, okay, I think okay. you should. Secondly, um, I think it's very important for uh, the consumers to be told that they shouldn't throw away these prescription drugs that then get into the water system, that they should mm -hmm. properly dispose of them in a manner that um, will not have it um, being leached into um, 
the water system and then creating more problems down the road. Um, so I want to talk about the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think the elephant in the room is that um, you don't have recall authority. This has been a voluntary recall by McNeil of 43 of their products, correct? So if they had chosen not to recall those products, you would have had to go to court in order to effectuate that result. Is that correct? Um, and it would have been challenging to do it through court. Um, so you probably wouldn't even been able to do it through the court. It, um, we would have had some ability to do some of it through court, but I think um, in this case, uh, you know, McNeil and Johnson Johnson agreed to do the recall, but I, I think that part of the issue, if you look across this whole time period, is that um, it, from the point of wanting to have a recall, there, there were some delays, and I think that it's a fair question to ask about mandatory recall authority. So you don't have mandatory recall authority. Um, if they had chosen not to recall those products, those products would still be on the shelves today. Is that a fair comment? Um, I think that probably is a fair comment, yes. All right, so Mr. Chairman, I think that's an issue that really um, needs to be addressed. Secondly, uh, if you look at the behavior of McNeil over the course of these two or three years, it reminds me of a kid in school who continues to get D's. Um, no one basically you know, takes any action. The kid never goes to the principal's office until three years down the road. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, very little action occurs. So my question is really about fines. Um, since your, your real power is somewhat limited outside of mm -hmm. you know, suggestions and negotiations, what kind of fines can be imposed? Um, can you close them down for 10 days? Um, what, kind of, what, what hammers do you have to utilize in your regulatory function? Um. I think I may ask uh, Deb, Deb Otter to answer that question. I can tell you we do not have civil money fines for these kinds of violations. So there are criminal penalties that would require going to court to get. But in terms of the ability to assess civil money penalties, which is part of the food safety bill, we don't have that in this area. Okay, of so do you think maybe that's part of the problem? Um, that getting compliance is more difficult because there's no hammer on any of these companies to, there's, there's no downside risk not to uh, ignore what FDA is requiring because you don't have any financial um, impact. Well, you know, I think the story here is that uh, we got their attention and there were major changes that were made over the course of this process, I, I even un under the existing law. Um, but having said that, I think you're asking a very fair question, which is with other tools, could FDA have gotten their attention faster and sooner and had a, had a quicker result? I think those are fair questions to ask. They're being asked in the context of food safety as well. And especially since you don't have the power for mandatory recall, how else do you get anyone's attention? Um, so if Ms. Is it Autor? Sure. Mm -hmm. Autor, yes. Thank you. Well, I, just to add on to what Dr. Sharfstein said, uh, we do not have any civil money, pe money penalty authority um, for violations of good manufacturing practices or drug labeling requirements. And to clarify my answer to Ms. Norton earlier, the only context in which we have civil money penalties for drugs are related to um, certain application requirements All right. uh, under Let the DOS. So it would be useful to us to have Okay, that. my time right. is running out. Um, cost recovery. A lot of money has been spent investigating, inspecting over and over and over again. How much does that cost the taxpayers of this country? And are you able to recover the costs associated with that? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. We'd have to get back to you on how much money exactly has been spent on it. I think, as uh, we said, there are a number of things that FDA is still considering um, in terms of enforcement in this situation. And one of our potential options would be to uh, seek um, to get uh, money back from um, the, the company if, if certain criteria were met, and that's part of the assessment that's probably going on. I thank um, the witnesses, and my time has expired. Gentlemen, time has expired. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Right. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing. Um, Dr. Sharstein, let me ask you, when troubles emerge or uh, are found or concerns raised, um, are there any remedies 
that can occur prior to recall? In terms of uh, whether we can fix the manufacturing process before the product gets recalled? Yes, I mean, if, if you find that there is a problem with the product mm -hmm. or there are concerns about a product or allegations of concerns about a product, what happens at that point? I think there's an assessment. Um, in some cases, the product has, may not have left the facility and you don't have to do a recall at all. It's still there and it just never gets sold. Um, and then there's an assessment, if it has gotten sold, of whether it's something that is uh, significant enough to require a recall. And we have a, you know, a, a standard for that um, and I think we're, one of the things we're going to do is, is take a look at that. But sometimes, you know, the, there, there's a problem and it can be addressed. We look at it, we get more information and we realize that it's, it doesn't pose any risk at all. And there does not need to be a recall, but there'll be fixes going forward. So it, it's kind of a case-by-case -case determination. But there are some times when we don't do a recall. In the event that um, there is um, just the continuation of, of production activity that is out of compliance or does not meet uh, specifications or requirements, uh, what can happen to a company? Um, if there's repeated violation, um, what you s we've seen so far is we, we call in the company, we can talk to them, we can send them warning letters, and then they can um, have other enforcement actions including uh, court ordered injunctions, we can seize their products, and then eventually we can refer um, to for criminal um, investigation and the people can be prosecuted criminally. Can you think of any instances where that has happened? Um, there, there have been uh, examples where there's been a quality problem so significant that it has led to that and uh, recently with a, a company actually in Massachusetts there was a um, major agreement that we reached that has yet to be blessed by the court that relates to um, quality problems and there are, I think well over a hundred million dollars is being uh, paid by the company back to the government because of um, uh, quality problems at their facility. And you know I think in that case and in this case it's really important to uh, realize the you know, critical role that FDA plays for, for drug safety and I think it's important to think of what would have happened in this case had FDA investigators um, not been on the job that we could expect that um, a lot of these problems would not have been caught, the changes at the company would not have been made and it eventually could get to a situation where there was a very serious uh, risk to the public. Thank you very much. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Let me just make a um, quick. Let me just make a quick um, um, uh, uh, statement to the members. We will have votes in just a matter of a few minutes, and what I'd like to do is to adjourn until after the uh, and come back ten minutes after the last vote. I can't say exactly what time it will be because I'm not sure as to how long it will take us with the four votes. But we would um, adjourn, I'm, I'm sorry, take a recess and then come back and then do the second panel. Um, if you'd like to have make a you know, fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just a very, very quick follow-up. Uh, the gentlelady from California before she leaves, uh, under the previous administration, there was an egregious failure by the FDA, and you probably remember it either from your time on the Hill or when you were in Baltimore. We had a spinach problem under the FDA. Bag of spinach coming from a specific location and a specific uh, farm was tainted. That led to a total recall of all spinach. You may not have had authority for mandatory, but the FDA made sure that spinach was dead in America for a period of time. What are you doing today to ensure, under the food side of food and drug, that if in fact a field of some fresh uh, vegetable is tainted, that only that field, if it can be identified, and in this case the bags were numbered, the, they could have named the manufacturer or at least the bagger, and they didn't. What are you doing to change that so the next time a bit of food 
similar to when beef is tainted uh, and agriculture controls it, that only the actual tainted or likely tainted or possibly tainted is recalled rather than an entire fresh vegetable segment being off the market for a period of time? That uh, is a uh, good question and that is something that we've, we've thought a lot about. In fact, the transparency report that we just posted has a whole section on the importance of FDA being as transparent as possible about the products that are not affected by recalls. And uh, for example, when there was a pistachio recall, FDA linked to an industry website of all the brands that were not involved with a particular farm at issue. Recently there was a, um, uh, a terrible outbreak that, uh, that was uh, related to romaine lettuce. FDA worked very quickly with states and localities and the CDC and we identified a distributor and we quickly were able to narrow it down so that when we did do a recall it was a relatively narrow recall. There's a balance between the scale of the recall and you know you could wait and, and the timeliness because you need to be f move fast because it's often perishable foods and you don't want people to eat um, that. Um, I think we realize that we want to be as absolutely as narrow as we possibly can when we're warning the public about food and I think you could look at the romaine uh, lettuce situation that just happened that I was quite involved in um, as an example of an area where we, we did our best to narrow it as quickly as possible and in fact it was very relatively narrow in how we, how we did it and we were able to get the products of concern off the market very quickly. Uh, last question, do you need any new authority in relation to food such as in the case of ground beef Every package of ground beef that is ground outside of the store in which it's sold has a manufacturer's ID, date code, and so on, so that the consumer can make a decision about whether they're covered by a, rate, uh, a, a code. In the case of packaged vegetables, that's also true. But in the case of unpackaged vegetables, the master pack may or may not contain sufficient information to find out for sure where it came from. Is that something that you could do within your own rulemaking authority, or does Congress need to act? That sounds like a question I'm going to want to get back to you on with a, with a good answer. I think but the chairman would appreciate yeah. it. But, but, but I would right. say that FDA strongly supports food safety legislation and we think it's really critical for our ability to establish the standards that are needed to protect the food supply. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Right. Just before we um, recess, let me just ask, um, have you checked to see whether or not the quality control staff has been decreased? Um, at McNeil? At yes. Um, I believe that one of the things that we're talking to the company about is their quality control staff, what their qualifications are, what kind of plans they're going to put into place. Everything related to the quality control staff, FDA is working with the company to make sure it's satisfactory. Right. Just before we uh, recess, the gentleman from Maryland, any comments or suggestions? No, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much and we will now recess until 10 minutes after the last vote. Cannot tell you the exact time we'll come back because we do not know how fast the votes will move. But this panel is dismissed. Thank you. Reconvene. Our second witness today is Colleen Goggins, worldwide chairman of the Johnson & Johnson Consumer Group. It is committee policy that all witnesses are sworn in. Please stand, Ms. Goggins, and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that 
The witness answered in the affirmative. Ms. Goggin, please give your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Chairman Towns, Congressman Issa, and members of the committee, my name is Colleen Goggins, and I serve as the worldwide chairman of the consumer group of Johnson & Johnson. In this position, I oversee the products that include the pediatric Tylenol, Motrin, Zyrtec, and Benadryl products that were recalled by McNeil Consumer Healthcare on April 30, 2010. McNeil is a Johnson & Johnson operating company, and I'm pleased to testify on behalf of Johnson & Johnson to present our understanding of the events. All of the Johnson & Johnson family of companies realize that we have a responsibility to provide consumers with the highest quality products possible. We are proud that our products help millions of people around the world improve their health and well-being. In this instance, we have not lived up to that responsibility. The quality issues in this recall are therefore a disappointment to our Chairman Bill Weldon, to me personally, and to the thousands, and to the thousands of employees in the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. McNeil, those that led to the recall and others are unacceptable. On behalf of McNeil and Johnson & Johnson, I apologize to the mothers, the fathers, and the caregivers for the concern and inconvenience caused by the recall. Johnson & Johnson embraces the work of this committee, and we hope that today's hearing will be an important step in furthering public understanding of the recall. Unfortunately, there has been some confusion in the media with respect to this recall. I'd like to stress, therefore, four key points that Dr. Sharfstein also reiterated this morning. First, as the FDA noted last month, the health risk to consumers from the recalled products are remote. Second, McNeil has no indication of a serious adverse medical event caused by any of the issues referenced in the recall announcement. Third, no raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of McNeil's pediatric products. And finally, McNeil rejected the products that it found had excess active ingredient and these never reached the marketplace. Because the McNeil products are used by millions of sick children each year, we receive many questions and reports on possible adverse events. We take all of these very seriously, assess all of them, and specifically investigate all serious adverse event reports, whether or not the events may have been caused by our products. As Dr. Sharfstein indicated, the mere existence of these normal and expected reports does not alter the medical conclusions of the FDA and our doctors that the safety risk from the recall products is remote. The recall last month was implemented because of the presence of minute metal particles detected in a small percentage of products. To be clear, these quality issues, including the minute particles, are unacceptable to us. For that reason, McNeil implemented a broad, precautionary recall of liquid children's and infants' medicines on April 30, 2010. Let me address the remote medical risks. First, with respect to the minute particles, McNeil's health assessment concluded that even if those products were distributed and the particles were ingested, the particles were inert, so small, and so few that they did not present a safety or health risk. Second, with respect to products with an excess concentration of acetaminophen, which McNeil rejected, McNeil's medical experts confirmed that even ingestion of the maximum label dose over an extended period of time with the highest identified level of excess acetaminophen would not present a medical concern. Third, with respect to raw materials, McNeil tested all raw materials and rejected any containers of raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria. No raw materials that tested positive were ever used in production. Although the medical risks were remote, we recognize that the quality and process deficiencies identified in McNeil's Fort Washington plant must be remedied. My written testimony contains additional details on these points and a summary of the steps that McNeil undertook and is undertaking to act quickly to implement this broad recall and the steps that Johnson & Johnson and McNeil are taking to address quality processes. In particular, we've made a number of personnel changes and embarked on a comprehensive assessment of McNeil's OTC facilities both before the FDA, both before the FDA inspection in April. 
The Johnson & Johnson Parent Company is committed to providing McNeil with all the resources and personnel needed to improve quality and to ensure that its product and processes meet the highest standards. Johnson & Johnson and McNeil take these issues very seriously and we're committed to taking the steps necessary to bring McNeil's operations back to the level of quality that Johnson & Johnson demands of its companies and that the public rightly expects of us. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to close in the same manner that our chairman, Bill Weldon, concluded his letter to the people who use our products. We will work hard to earn back your confidence. I'd now be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your statement, uh, Ms. Goggins. Uh, before I begin, um, I want to say that Johnson & Johnson is a family brand. And the American people have come to rely on that for more than 100 years. Until recently, most people would not think twice about giving their child one of your products. In fact, most Americans have at least one or more of your products in their home. But I have become deeply concerned about your company. The information I've seen during the course of our investigation raises questions about the integrity of the company. It paints a picture of a company that is deceptive, dishonest, and has, and has risked the health of many of our children. As the ranking member, Mr. Issa, said earlier in his opening statement, I hope that you will be forthcoming today about your company. And on that note, let me just go to a couple questions. Is it true that excess amount of certain active ingredients were found in your children's medicines? Uh, Chairman Towns, it is true that lots of the product were produced with excess amounts of the medicines, but these never reached the marketplace. In fact, as I think Ms. Otter said earlier this morning, we produced um, something like 10 or 11 lots of product. Three were rejected on that grounds. The other seven were tested. And I should say we test all of our finished products extensively. We take samples from the beginning, the middle, and the end of manufacturing. And we make sure they're within the specification. They were. We released them to the marketplace. When the FDA raised its concerns, we tested the last batch, which we had in our possession. We actually tested 1,200 bottles, and not one of the 1,200 bottles was over the specified amount of active ingredient. So was that a yes or no? I'm sorry. Um, that, is, that is that no product with excess acetaminophen entered the marketplace to the best of our knowledge in testing. But it was actually found in the medicine, so that would be a yes. It was found, but it was rejected, sir. It never reached the marketplace. Would you agree that these quality control issues are totally unacceptable? I would absolutely agree with that, yes, sir. Did you have contractors go back to stores and buy medicine instead of recalling the medicine? No, we did. Let me explain that, sir. I think it's very important. There's been a lot of misinformation about the entirety of this recall, and I'm glad you raised that issue right now because I think there's misperceptions. We did have a, a Motrin dissolution issue in 2009. We it was on a small product that was distributed in gasoline stations. We discussed with the San Juan District of the FDA um, this issue. We just talked to them about hiring a third party contractor to go to see the breadth of the distribution of these products. So we were in discussions with them. They knew that we'd hired this third party and the third party did go out to make an inventory and we discussed that with the San Juan office of the FDA. So there was never any intent to mislead or hide anything from anyone. So the San Juan office of the FDA were aware of the fact that you were going out to uh, purchase? That is correct, sir. We were in discussions with them. Let me make sure that I understand. Now, you went out and you purchased them, but the FDA was aware of the fact that you were going to do it? Let me, let me see if I can explain what happened. Yeah, help we, me. Yeah. We had um, a Motrin product where the dissolution profile, or how it's solubilized, wasn't in specification. So it was sold, it's a small product, it's sold primarily in gas stations. We discussed this issue with the San Juan office of the FDA, 
and we agreed or we offered to have a contract force go out and identify how much of this was in the marketplace. The FDA was aware that we were doing that in San Juan and we did that. I can't tell you about the behavior of these contractors in the market or what the dissent or didn't say or how they acted, but clearly FDA was aware of this and um, there was no intent obviously to mislead or hide anything. In other words, to tell us, for the contractors to go in and say, uh, uh, do not mention the fact that this is a recall, you know nothing about any of that. I know nothing about that, sir. I know only that we were in discussions with the FDA in San Juan over the product issue and how we were planning to handle it with a third party, co third party contractor. Yeah. Do you have any kind of documents or anything that might be able to confirm what you're saying? Because, you know, I just find it, you know, um, in terms of the fact that FDA is saying that they learned of this and uh, later on, if you're in discussions with them, you know, why wouldn't they know it immediately? Chairman Towns, I can't answer that question. What I can do is I can promise you to get back to you with the kind of documentation what we have to, uh, regarding this issue. In fact, I'd welcome the opportunity. Yeah, well, I would like for you to do that for me because I'm happy to. I just find this very, very disturbing, in fact, that um, that they went in to, to purchase these, the products. FDA is saying they had no knowledge of it. And of course. Uh, um, no more disturbing than I do, sir. Right. How can this happen in a company of your size and reputation? I mean, how could this, something like this happen? Your, your company's had a long standing reputation, you know, and. Uh, you know, that's a question we've been asking ourselves, and what I can tell you is that we think it comes down to a number of factors. It comes down to people and leadership and processes, and what I can tell you is that um, we've made significant changes in the leadership. We've actually changed six key executive positions. We've changed the head of OTC uh, manufacturing. We've changed the head of OTC quality. We've changed the head of uh, the plant at McNeil, uh, excuse me, at Fort Washington. We've changed the head of quality at Fort Washington. We've changed the head of quality at our Puerto Rico plant. We've changed the head of manufacturing, and we've re reassigned people at other levels. So, um, so all of your quality issues have now been solved. Well, I would not say that, sir. What I would say, in addition, is that we've taken undertaken a broad assessment of all of our OTC plants. We've engaged a, pro a third party contractor, um, a third, excuse me, third party expert to take a look at our plants and help us do this assessment. And we've committed to the FDA that by July 15th we'll have a master plan regarding the remediation of all of our plants as necessary. Right. Thank you. And now you have five minutes to the gentleman from California, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since you patiently sat through the first hearing, you're, uh, you're aware of my line of questioning, so I'm going to sort of follow up, mm -hmm. uh, sort of FDA you. Sure. You told me that uh, in the, your testimony and in the Chairman's questions, you said Basically, there was no safety issue in relation to the product that got out of the plant, period. Not the product that may have had been multiple times its effective uh, or advertised dosage that remained in the plant as defective material, but the product that got out of the plant, as of right now, science, both at the FDA and you, considered that there was no health risk from that product, is that correct? Yes, the FDA and Johnson & Johnson and McNeil is aligned that the risk of a serious health event is remote and to date there have been no serious health events associated okay. with any of the reasons for the recall. Okay, so the recall was more about <clears throat> failure to live up to your own standards and therefore a recall, not, uh, and, and of course the potential that if you didn't live up to your own standards something bad could happen, but the actual product being recalled is not dangerous to the consumer. That is correct. Now, in the case of, uh, and ma'am, you're, you're very good and scientific. If I understood what you said about the, uh, uh, the Advil product, uh, uh, the, the gasoline station. Motrin. Motrin. Yes, Motrin. Wrong brand. The Motrin. What you've got is paper two packs that they sell at gas stations. And if you take these, you're not getting much use out of them because they don't dissolve properly. Is That's that correct. right? That is correct, yes. So in plain English, they simply wouldn't cure your headache, but they wouldn't hurt you. It would take longer to cure your headache, yes, and they would not hurt you, though. No, okay, that's so it's not going to hurt you, just not going to be correct. as good as advertised. And you hired a contractor to try to do it, and you did inform, you've said under oath, you did inform the FDA, at least at their local yes. level. Uh, <clears throat> I was a manufacturer for 20 years. 
Uh, under ISO 9001, if you find a defect, you do two things. You segregate the defects and, of course, you go through a quality analysis to try to keep that from happening again. Right. In the case of the uh, Fort Washington facility, if that was where these products were produced that were multiple times their, their normal dosage, or was it Puerto Rico? I, I didn't no, it was Port Washington, Port sir. Washington. You segregated the product, is that correct? We did. You destroyed the product. I believe so. And what steps were taken to prevent this from reoccurring? Um, that you, if you know. Yes, I don't. I believe I don't. I honestly don't know the answer to that. What I can tell you is that we had a rigorous testing program um, to ensure that um, the products were within specification before they hit the marketplace. And we did go back and we took a look at the last lot that we had in our possession. Did extensive testing, 1,200 bottles. Um, I don't know that we. I can't answer right now about what we did or didn't to go back to test the root cause. Now, some months ago. We think famously, but we're in Washington, so our image of what's famous may not be. But we had Akio Toyota sitting where you're sitting. He made commitments to us that he would use dramatic resources on a scale not seen before to change his company mm -hmm. to be the leader, not the follower, ahead of, not behind in quality. Can you make that same commitment today on behalf of Johnson & Johnson? Yes, I can, and I think I can give you some points that indicate that we're Please. on the road to doing that. Um, as I mentioned, we've changed a number of key personnel, both in quality and in our manufacturing organization. Um, we have contracted with an outside expert with pharmaceutical experience to help take a look at our plants independently and determine what needs to be done. We've undertaken on our own a, an assessment of all of our plants across our North American OTC network. We've made some changes already and I think perhaps most importantly, we've committed to the FDA that we'll have a comprehensive plan that we'll share with them on, by July 15th. Excellent answer. I, I, I hope you live up to it. I uh, expect after 100 years of your company, good reputation that you have a reason to. Let me follow up with sort of a final line. Uh, <clears throat> again, I said I was a manufacturer. I'm not bragging or complaining. But before I could sell to General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, and others, I had to pass independent uh, QS and ISO uh, analysis. And they came back in regularly. So in, in addition to my own quality folks, in addition to the auto companies and other companies I supplied to over the years, we had ongoing annual and quarterly independent evaluation. Is there a similar situation or is there a similar capability within your industry and do you employ it? I think there are, I think there are two ways that we can do that, sir. One is that we can employ uh, the corporate quality resources of Johnson & Johnson and in fact we've brought a lot of those to bear in the current situation and they take an independent look at our processes at McNeil. And the second thing is I, I've mentioned we have um, engaged a third party expert in manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, manufacturing processes and sites, and we've engaged them to help us take a look at our plants comprehensively. Well, in closing, I, uh, I would say that public confidence would be increased, and I hope that you will consider a level of transparency of these independent reviews, and uh, if at all possible, that that independent review be ongoing for a period of time. I, for one, uh, applauded the FDA uh, for being diligent in this case, uh, as you can imagine, I'm much more concerned about the fact that you test your products three times as to potency and what's in it. Well, in fact, the FDA does not test even once products coming in by the container load from countries and facilities they have no ability to test. So, Mr. Chairman, I hope that as we follow up in this process, that latter will be included in our question of is our food and, and drug safe? under the current law if they're imported. I yield back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, for his uh, questions. I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. I'd ask the uh, staff to put the first exhibit up. <clears throat> Ms. Goggins, uh, you've testified that uh, no raw materials that tested positive for objectionable bacteria were ever used in the manufacture of McNeil's pediatric products. Now, uh, an FDA a document which I have a copy of here states McNeil's lab determined the presence of B. sapatia in Avacil raw material to be objectionable, placing the target population at risk if the contaminant was in the product. The product is for use in infants and children. However, the firm knowingly 
the firm knowingly proceeded to re partially release some of the remaining raw material, Avacil, which was used to manufacture more product. What's your response? My response sir, is, that, that, is that that is untrue. Um, what I would tell you is that... What's untrue? Your testimony or we, this document from the FDA? My testimony is not, in, is not incorrect, so let me clarify the issue for you. This is one of the issues that has been in the media and is simply incorrect. It is true that we tested one incoming um, lot of, Avis, of Avacil, which is an inactive ingredient in our children's products. It tested positive for an objectionable bacteria. We rejected it. We test each of our incoming raw materials. We've tested them all extensively. Um, we have never used, when they, we've never used a product that tests positive for objectionable bacteria in our manufacturing process. Further, when our products are manufactured, we test them after manufacturing for the presence of, of harmful bacteria. We've also had preservative systems and other capabilities in our formulas, which would, if a bacteria was in our product, preclude the growth of that bacteria. Um, we also then, given the FDA's concerns on this issue, went back, we tested retained products of these, of these uh, products in question. None of them tested positive for this bacteria. We then went back and we tested the preservative systems by inoculating them with bacteria and the preservative systems killed all the bacteria. So I feel very confident in saying that we did not knowingly use, the, we did not knowingly use products you. with bacteria and we did not release them into the marketplace. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, this memo also states at the end of inspection an FDA 483 was issued for deficiencies including failure to reject Avacil raw material after learning of B. Cepatia contamination of raw material Avacil. Then it gives the, the lot number. I submit this for the record. Uh, Without staff put up, ordered. Staff put up the second exhibit. Uh, a six-year-old boy took medication that was manufactured at your plants in Fort Washington in Puerto Rico. Uh, he died this year. He tested positive for uh, B. Cepatia. I have a report here which is a McNeil Consumer and Specialty Pharmaceuticals uh, in-house document dated May 10, 2010, uh, where they state that the child was taking medications that were manufactured at Las Pedras plant and Fort Washington plant, uh, that uh, you, you apparently were in touch with the coroner who mentioned the child was sick for nausea and vomiting, goes on to give other details, say the child's sputum was tested positive for the B. Cepatia, uh, uh, complex that is the subject of this. Do you have any knowledge of that? Yes, I do, sir. And what's your response? My response is the same as Dr. Sharfstein, sir, in that we take every adverse medical event seriously. We investigate this. We did discuss this with the coroner. Um, the products, as Dr. Sharfstein said this morning, tested negative for the presence of B. Cepatia. And in fact, the products that the young child was administered were not even in the investigation of the B. Cepatia issue. Are you aware that the, uh, that the Food and Drug Administration uh, official also testified that a coroner's report has not yet been returned on that? Number yes. three, I'd like the third uh, exhibit put up. Another six-year-old boy with cystic fibrosis took Tylenol and tested positive for B. Cepatia. As I'm sure you know, children with cystic fibrosis are particularly susceptible to B. Cepatia, according to the uh, CDC. And this is a, uh, also, I want to submit this to the record without objection, an establishment inspection report, McNeil Consumer Health Division, uh, where it confirms that a, uh, a, a six-year-old child tested positive for uh, a form of B. cepatia. And uh, uh, it says, during the inspection, another complaint was received by the FDA. No details were given except there was a death of a baby in reference to the use of concentrated Tylenol infants drops. Uh, this goes to the record. Now, Ms. Goggins, can you tell the American people what they should think when they learn that the FDA found that McNeil knowingly let contaminated raw material into children's medicine and that a contaminant was found in at least two children, one of whom died? As I said, Congressman, we never used contaminated raw materials in the manufacturing of McNeil pediatric products. Mr. Chairman, that's at variance with a document that we, we got uh, from, the, from the FDA. And I think the, sub the committee ought to take further note of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the gentleman for his questions. And of course, um, uh, we have not made a decision as to what we're going to do from this point on. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. 
Mr. Chairman, I would yield to the general lady from, from Washington. The general lady from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton, is recognized <coughs> for five minutes. Uh, I thank the gentleman for, for yielding. Um, I am concerned, uh, Ms. Goggins, about the, the, the delay here. I can understand that there could be difficulties in manufacturing, but I believe you need to clarify for the public why delay doesn't give the appearance of cover-up. The FDA, as you know, found that, and I'm using their words now, that, um, that your investigation or McNeil's investigation unjustifiably delayed uh, and terminated prematurely. Now, that's what concerns me because apparently the, the, the complaints began with an uncharacteristic bad odor. Now, I can see given the symptoms that were reported and we understand those to have been nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and you're talking about children, I can tell you somebody who had kids, they all do that anyway. I can understand you're thinking that could have had any number of causes. What I don't understand is why any manufacturer hearing, uh, if you will forgive me, that its product stunk, <laughs> wouldn't immediately see that as a justification for investigation. Yet, I understand it took 100 complaints uh, and that you did not discover the contamination until September 2009, although this bad odor began in April 2008. Why did it take you so long, particularly given the bad odor, which seems to me should have been enough, yes, to, let me, let me, to find what was the root cause of, of this uh, contamination? Yes, you're referring to the recall um, that we executed between November and January regarding the contamination of our products with TBA. Um, we did receive a number of complaints uh, regarding these products and manufactured in our Las Piedras, Puerto Rico facility. The complaints were characterized by the consumers as a moldy and musty odor. We did, we did engage in an investigation of microbiology because when we get a complaint of uh, musty moldy, we assume that it's a micro issue. Um, there was no evidence of any kind of a micro issue. Si for six months, we then received no complaints whatsoever and we thought the issue had gone away. And then um, in April, I believe, of 2009, the, uh, the complaints came back, and that's when we realized that um, we needed to deepen our investigation. What I guess I would say about this is that this is a very, this is a very unusual compound. It's not well ca characterized. It's not well known. It's not been found in the industry. Well, did it, did it ever have a bad odor before? Is it that uh, unusual? Not due to this, uh, not due to this contaminant, ma'am, no. This is the first. Um, so, if I can just, if I can just, yes. if I can just continue, please. So we found that um, there's only, there was only one lab in the country that we were able to locate that could identify what this was, and there were only two experts in the world that we could identify, one in California and one in France, to characterize this. We finally found what the product was when we did. Um, in January, we recalled a quite extensive amount of product, about 565 lots of product, and I think we did out of an abundance of caution. I would add that there's been no adverse medical events due to the trace <coughs> levels of this contaminant. Yeah, after the fact, we're grateful. Um, but of course, the FDA's concern was in the delay here. We don't know what, what this might have, have done had it been something more serious, uh, particularly since the regu regulations require drug, drug manufacturers uh, to submit field reports within three days of receipt of information of uh, contamination, bacteria and contamination of some kind, uh, or for that matter of any change or deterioration in, in a drug product. Um, apparently, uh, McNeil began receiving complaints in 2008, but you did not follow this three-day uh, three requirement and did not alert the FDA, FDA. <coughs> um, why didn't you share this information immediately with the, uh, with the FDA? Indeed, after you had results confirming contamination, you didn't share those results immediately with the, with the, uh, with the FDA. You know, I must say, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not certain of the chronology of these events, but what I can tell you is that... You began I receiving consumer complaints in 2008. You did not, uh, and this is why FDA found unjustifiable delay 
and termination prematurely. You began receiving them in 2008. The regulations require you to report within three days of receipt of any, any information regarding bacterial con contamination. Did you believe that you had to have them confirmed in some kind of way before you alerted FDA? I can't tell you when we did or did not alert FDA. What I can tell you is that we did undertake a micro investigation of it, and it was found not to have any micro contamination. Other than that, I can't tell you about the chronology. Again, I want you to know, Ms. Goggins, uh, the concern here from the point of view of the consumer I understand. is delay. Uh, it, it, transparency helps a great deal to ward off the notion of cover-up. And FDA finds unjustifiable delay and, and premature termination of complaints. You say yes, but we, we essentially waited to see if it would come back. And when it came back, we decided to do it again. That is very troubling. Seems to me once you have 100 complaints about a bad order in something you're telling to the public, uh, you ought to want to tell the FDA immediately, and you ought to want to do something very quickly. It didn't happen very quickly if we're going from April 2008 to September 2009. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Woman from, from Washington, D.C. I know you have five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Goggins, um, tell me, um, when did you learn that there were serious problems at McNeil? When, when did you first learn that? I mean, I think we became aware, sir, that there were ish quality issues uh, probably in the first half of 2009. Okay. And according to our investigation, you made, uh, you all had a major shakeup of McNeil management. I think you've already testified to that. Is that correct? Uh, we did replace a number of key uh, quality and manufacturing individuals. Yes, sir. And can you tell me what went into that decision? What, how, why did, first of all, who made the decision? Um, it was, I was part of that decision, sir, and uh -huh. there were other people who were involved as well, but I was part of that decision. Uh -huh. And what was that, why did you make that, what was that decision, how did you come to the conclusion that you had to shake up the management? I think the fact that we uh, were not happy with our quality processes based on some of the things that we saw both in terms of recalls and in terms of some of the FDA, um, the FDA uh, observations that we got in a Form 483, and I think we were also concerned about some of the uh, the issues that have been raised here today. And you, you understand, um, you know, it's, it's one thing. I was, when um, Mr. Sharpstein, Dr. Sharpstein was testifying, I was trying to get a clarification. You know, it's one thing if you go to McDonald's and you get a sandwich and it has a worm in it, God forbid, and then McDonald's says, you know what, it's no big deal can't do you any harm. That's one standard. And, but the standard is it should never have been a worm in the, in the sandwich. I know that's a little extreme for those people who haven't eaten their lunch, but. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you is that I'm wondering if there's a difference of the standard. First of all, it sounds like McNeil didn't even adhere to its own standard, let alone FDA's. Would you agree? Um, I would say, sir, that we are, um, I think we have, there are a number, we have a very high standard because I think consumers expect a lot of us and I think we did not adhere to that high standard on a quality, on the quality standpoint. That's why we enacted this broad recall. And can we put a pen in that right now, right where you are right there? And should consumers expect the, the high standard? They should, sir, and our intention is to remediate our plants to the highest possible standards. Now, Ms. Goggins, can Johnson & Johnson tell the American people today with complete certainty that no children who took these recall medicines were harmed by them? You know, what I can do is reiterate what Dr. Sharfstein said this morning, that we um, don't believe that there, the, we believe that the risk of a serious medical event is remote, and there have been no serious medical events associated with the reasons for the recall of these products. Now, you said that you all had some concerns and you heard Dr. Sharfstein's testimony. It sounds like he had some concerns uh, with regard to the way things were going along. And it's one thing if it's one instance, but there's another thing when there's a, it appears to be a pattern of these things. Is that one of the things that concerns you? Um, I think the number more than the pattern, sir, there were a different number of plants and different number of products and different number of medicines involved and different number of issues, but the number concerned me, yes. And what were the top three issues that went into your decision to bring in new management? Just curious. 
Well, as I said, I think that the uh, – Give me the top three. The top three. The so the public can hear what, what, what went on when you all decided to make this change so that hopefully they can have some confidence when they buy these uh, products. I think it was the number of quality issues we had, the quality issues themselves, and the fact that um, the FDA had made observations that we were very disappointed in. Now, would you agree that government has a role in, in, in uh, making sure that products that end up uh, in the medicine cabinets of the public uh, are safe? I would, like most Americans, I have a great deal of respect for the FDA. I think they have an important mission, an important operation, and they've been very professional in their dealings with us. So yes, I agree with you. Now, a little bit earlier, there was a, a statement uh, by one of the witnesses from the FDA that this matter had been referred uh, for possible criminal uh, prosecution. Did you hear that? I did, yes. And w w are you concerned about that? Sir, my major concern right now is remediating our plants to the highest possible level of quality and getting products back on the marketplace for the consumers who need them. And the Fort Washington plant, that's basically closed down right now? It is closed down right now, yes. And when do you expect that to reopen? I don't know, sir. Um, what I can tell you is that we will not reopen that plant until we meet our own and the public's and the FDA standards for high quality and safety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, gentleman from Maryland. Uh, yeah, I want to just, Ms. Uh, Goggin, go back to this contractor business. Now, the contractors, what were they contracted to do and who contracted them? Explain all this to me because it's just not clear to me. I can tell you what I know and then I promise you I'll come back to you with more information. Um, the product in question is sparsely, sparsely distributed, as I understand it, primarily in gas stations. So I think the idea was to go in and identify how much product there was on the shelves. But beyond that, I don't know, sir. We did contract them, but as I said, I'm told that we contracted them in discussions and with the knowledge of the San Juan office of the FDA. So I guess what I'm saying, were they instructed to go out and buy you know, if they found... Uh, I can't answer that, sir, nor can, I, nor can I answer the question of what they're alleged to have said. I don't know the answers to that. Well, I'd like for you to get back to us on it, because these contractors, I mean, you know, I, I just find this very disturbing, you know. Um, As do I. Yeah. Okay, so um, in other words, you do not know who actually contracted them or what their role and responsibility uh, uh, was you don't know any of that with those kind of I know questions. only that I imagine we contracted them sir and we did so as I'm told with the knowledge of the FDA mm -hmm. were they instructed to do certain things uh, I can't I can't tell you right now what they were instructed to do or not sir you know uh, the quality control do you have the same amount of people in the quality control unit today as you had four years ago, three years ago, I mean, uh, or eight years ago? I believe. What's the situation with quality control? Yeah, I believe that at the Fort Washington plant, our head count is basically flat. I do know that between 2006 and 2009, we increased our spending 17 percent, and I know that we've increased it again this year. Mm -hmm. This document that was actually just brought to my attention uh, says this, you should simply act like a regular customer while making these purchases. There must, must be no mention of this being a recall of the product. If asked, simply state that your employer is checking the distribution chain of this product and needs to have some of it purchased for the project. It's a demonstration project, and we want to purchase some for the demonstration project. Is this accurate? As I said, sir, I have no idea. What I can tell you is that um, I have no idea of, of whether or not that was is true or not, and I also have no idea of the context, sir. I have no idea. All I know is that we contract. We did hire a third-party contractor, and I do know that we did it with discussions with the FDA, and they were aware of it. But let me put it this way: If this is true, does it bother you? Um, again, I don't know the context, sir. I, if, if 
Thank you. I don't know the context. I'd have to understand the context. I don't believe there was any intent to mislead or hide anything. So I don't know the answer to that. So I can't answer that. really trying to finish this, but I tell you, there's just some unanswered questions here that just are very troubling. On that note, I yield to the ranking member, Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days in which to uh, ask additional questions, supplement, or provide information. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Uh, this email, I think, speaks for itself. Uh, what we don't have here is we don't have the individuals behind that. Uh, can I ask that you use your authority to investigate the email? We'll certainly give you a copy if you don't have it. And get back to us in detail with either the individual and statements that they would make for us subject to our interrogatories if we choose, uh, and at least their side of the story. Because on the face of it all, I look at this and it appears as though people acting on your behalf, uh, working for one of your subsidiaries, did ask for this information, and we'd be appre we'd appreciate knowing for sure the individual, assuming they're still working with you. If they're not, then provide us the information, and we'll contact them directly. Uh, my understanding uh, from our investigators is that there was a cutback, not on your watch, but at this facility in 2006, a reshuffling of where uh, quality personnel uh, were located. Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, I do not. What I can tell you is what I referenced earlier, that in fact the headcount is flat um, from 2006 till now, and in fact spending up, was up 17 percent 2006 to 2009, and it's up again this year. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, there were a lot of questions about, about deaths of, uh, I heard a number as high as 37. To date, are you involved in any litigation in which you're the defendant where someone is alleging that your products, those 37 if you will, your Tylenol series products are, have led to the death or severe injury of some uh, child? You know, not to my knowledge, but let me just say that I would ne necessarily know that and I'd ask you if we could get back to you if we talk to our legal group. I would appreciate it if you'd respond in writing. I guess lastly, uh, you use imported products like all companies at times, is that correct? I believe we do, yes. Uh, my understanding is the source of the smelly pallets could well have been imported wood. Uh, is that correct? Or we at least believe, not mainland U.S.? We believe that um, our packaging, our supplier of packaging components did use wood from Latin America that was treated with this ingredient, yes. Okay, so I just want you to run us through, uh, I've dealt with import and production from all over the world and in all of, uh, other parts of the world. What did you do after this extensive research, finding only two people in the world that could do it, but you got to the fact that you had a problem. What did you do relative to the vendor uh, for the future? In other words, what corrective action was in your quality loop relative to not having this happen again? Uh, one thing, the main thing we did, sir, was that um, not just for the McNeil organization, but for Johnson & Johnson in total, we mandated that we would only use uh, material that came in on heat-treated wooden pallets, which precludes the use of this fungicide, mm -hmm. or plastic pallets where you don't use it at all. Okay, and, and I guess last, uh, presently the federal government uh, has had a series of problems here in the U.S., more of them related to the vitamin industry of imported vitamins from outside the U.S., but some related to uh, non-prescription drugs. If you were sourcing vitamins, ingestible products, non-prescription drugs from completely outside of your own production, outside of the U.S. and outside of factories you control, how often would you test them and how often would you visit the facilities and what level of transparency would you require in order to bring that product to the American people? You know, I, what I can do is perhaps um, draw an analogy to what we do now with raw materials and I imagine our standards would be exactly the same. We require all of our suppliers to give us a certificate saying that they've tested the product and it meets the specification which required from them. That being said, when the products arrive at our own facilities, we retest them for identity, for potency, for, you know, for microbial contamination. 
Um, and then when we use them in the raw final goods, excuse me, we do test them again. Well, and I we appreciate that. And, and although I, I, we don't make it a practice to look at any one private company when we write legislation, this committee is very interested in the question of drug and food safety. And as imports increase, uh, both raw materials that you may be checking, but finished product that come in uh, from overseas complete and in the container, it, is, it became apparent in the earlier FDA portion that it is not tested to that level, that the, uh, the inspection of your facilities uh, seven times in five years does not occur in an aspirin factory in China. So uh, I would appreciate the input you could give as we begin looking at how we should instruct the FDA and other agencies to inspect similar products coming in from around the world where we have no such luxury as to send inspectors seven times in five years. We'd be happy to provide that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Gentleman from Maryland. <laughs> Thank you very much. For five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I won't even take five minutes. Um, I understand that you are, you basically uh, retraining folks. Is, are you, is that retraining completed or is that ongoing? No, it's ongoing. We have a large, we will be undertaking, we've already started to undertake uh, training programs. Uh -huh. And how do you, what kind of things are you emphasizing in this retraining? Um, we're I'm emphasizing a, a commitment to quality. We're emphasizing um, adherence to good general manufacturing, good manufacturing practices, um, and a number of other things. I would say that our program definition isn't complete yet, and one of the things we're doing with the third party experts we've hired, the independent experts, is we're putting together a comprehensive plan which we'll share with the FDA on July 15th. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a chairman of the committee on the Coast Guard, and one of the things that they do in the Coast Guard is whenever they have a, uh, a problem, they take that problem and they use it as a learning tool. Uh, is that part of this process? Um, it could well be, sir. It's a good idea. Yeah, it's, it's helpful that way because, again, if you're talking about having, and I noticed that you ended your testimony uh, saying that you wanted, you all wanted to make sure you earn the trust of the public, it seems to me that if there's a training process that in order for it to be effective, not only effective with regard to changes in, within the corporation, but also effective with regard to the public having confidence, seems as if you would have to almost certainly uh, show these new folks or whoever the old folks, whoever's there, whoever you're training, uh, what has happened and how those things should not happen again. So I would make that very, very strong suggestion. I just want to go back. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm curious. This, uh, I wish I could have been a fly in the room when you fired all these people. How many people did you all fire? You know, I can't give you the exact number of people who are no longer in their position. But you were there, weren't you? I was not there, no, sir. Oh, I thought you yes, just sir. told me you were in the meeting. No, no. I was, I was, uh, I was involved in the decision to uh, fire these people. I was oh, not you, there myself. Oh, oh, oh. So you just, you weren't, <laughs> you weren't in the room. You helped to give the order. I, d I was part of the discussion, yes, sir. Okay, all right. I'm sorry. I didn't. So, but were a number of people dismissed? Um, the, we have new, yes, we have, we have a number of new people in the most senior positions in both our quality and our manufacturing organizations. And are they, do you know whether a lot of these people are from in house or a lot of them out house? From no, the they, were all, they were all our employees, sir. They were already employees? They were all our employees. And so you all, is that the, your normal procedure when you have a, have a problem, you, you bring people from within and not anybody from outside? No, we, we do both. Or we have people both, um, we hire people both inside and outside in different jobs depending on the qualifications. And then we also will bring fresh pairs of eyes in as we have done in this case with an independent third party consultant. And just one last thing I'd ask you about the Fort Washington uh, plant, what are you all doing now to try to reopen it? I mean, in other words, what is the process there? First of all, do you, do you, you plan to reopen it, are you not? We do plan to reopen it, yes, okay, sir. Okay, and what is the process there? 
Uh, the process right now, I guess there's two major prongs to the process. One is we're undertaking a, a, a massive assessment ourselves of not only the Fort Washington plant but all the other plants in our OTC network in North America. And the second is we have brought in this third party um, expert who has a lot of pharmaceutical experience to help independently tell us what we should do. Our plan is to combine those two assessments and discuss the master plan for remediation with the FDA by July 15th. Um, and just the last thing, when you all were meeting and firing these people, making the decision to fire them, I take it that this was embarrassing. This is an embarrassing episode to you all, is it not? The entire episode is extremely embarrassing to Johnson & Johnson. We take our commitment to our consumers on quality and safety very seriously. And of the people of Johnson and Johnson and McNeil are deeply troubled by what we've, what's found and we are all committed, deeply committed to remediating it. Well, I look forward to seeing the results of your efforts to remediate. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Uh, from Maryland for uh, his questions. Um, Mr. Goggin and let me just say FDA, what we've heard today is not too reassuring or comforting. The initial story was bad enough. On April the 30th, Johnson & Johnson announced the largest recall of children's medicine in history. But it turns out there wasn't just one recall. What we have heard about today is rolling recalls, a phantom recall, a plant shutdown, and management firing. I think there are still unanswered questions. J&J &J told the committee staff that this most recent recall involved only six million bottles. That's what they told staff. That's a huge number. But today we learned from the FDA that it was almost 20 times that, namely 136 million bottles. J&J &J testified that there was no attempt to hide anything. But we uncovered a J&J &J document showing that they told their contractors not to say this is a recall, just buy up everything. J&J says that none of its contaminated products has had any adverse health effects. But the FDA testified today that the issue of whether any of these products cause deaths is still being investigated. This is an issue of trust. When parents and grandparents give these medicines to their children, <coughs> they want to be confident that they are not harmful. Johnson & Johnson has the duty to ensure their safety and the FDA has a duty to enforce that duty. One thing we know now is that the FDA needs mandatory recall authority. They should not have to persuade a company to recall suspect products. I intend to introduce legislation, Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Ranking Member, and uh, to give FDA that authority, and I hope you'll join me. FDA should also have the power to order a halt in drug production. At this point, there are still many unanswered questions. We intend to look further. Not sure we have we hold the record open to get additional information and to have some of the questions that we raise answered. And then based on that, we'll make a decision as to what we will do from this point on. On that note, I yield to the ranking member. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, w I won't have a closing statement. I would just join with you in uh, offering to work on bipartisan legislation to provide FDA additional tools, including uh, mandatory uh, recall capability. Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen, for uh, his uh, statement and his willingness to work along with me. On that note, the committee now is adjourned. Thank you, Jack. Definitely, man. You too.
this holiday weekend. Nonfiction books and authors on C-SPAN 2's Book TV. On Afterwards, Perfect Storm author Sebastian Younger and his newest book, War, embedded with the 173rd Airborne in Afghanistan.